I'd like to uh, call this meeting of the Lakewood City Council for Tuesday, September 8th to order. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council Member Bokey. Does not appear that he is with us. Council Member Brandsetter. Here. Council Member Farmer. Here. Council Member Moss. Here. Council Member Simpson. Deputy Mayor Whalen. Here. And Mayor Anderson. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Now the first item of business is a proclamation declaring September 11th, 2020 as Patriot Day and Day of Remembrance. And for this, we have uh, Police Chief Mike Zaro of the Lakewood Police Department and Chief Jim Sharp of the West Pierce Fire and Rec uh, Rescue. And I thought Chief Sharp might be out fighting fires. So you let the record reflect that uh, Council Member Bulky is uh, joining us. Let's get the Chief and Chief on. Getting a lot of sleep, Chief Sharp. Um, yeah, so far. Good. Well, I have a virtual proclamation to hand you. <laughs> Whereas on September 11th, 2001, nearly 3,000 innocent lives and it disappeared from my screen. Uh, whereas on September 11th, 2001, nearly 3,000 innocent lives of men, women, and children who had been going about their nor normal routines were taken from us, depriving our families and loved ones of a lifetime of precious moments, and whereas in the years that followed, our capacity to love and to hope has guided us forward as we work to rebuild our nation more sound and resilient than ever before, while standing strong as one people determined to further embolden our country's character with acts of endurance and strength, renewal and progress. And whereas the pain inflicted on our nation on September 11th was felt by people of every race, background, and faith, Though many young Americans have grown up without knowing firsthand the horrors of that day, their lives have been shaped by it. And whereas the compassion that rose in the hearts and minds of the American people on September 11th still serves as an ultimate rebuke to the evil of those who attacked us, and whereas first responders who had risked and gave their lives to rescue others demonstrated the unwavering heroism that continues to define our great nation, and whereas as we reflect on the lives we lost and pay tribute to the families who still live with extraordinary pain, let us resolve to continue to the, continue embodying the American spirit that no act of terror can ever extinguish. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Lakewood Council hereby proclaims September 11th, 2020 as Patriot Day and a day of remembrance in the City of Lakewood and urges all citizens to observe a moment of silence in honor of the innocent victims who perished as a result of the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, and observe this day with remembrance in honor of those individuals. Proclaimed this eighth day of September, 2020, Don Anderson, Mayor. I invite uh, Chief Sharp to uh, make any comments that he wishes to make. Uh, thank you, Mayor Anderson, uh, Deputy Mayor Whalen, members of the council. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to remember the losses of September 11th. Uh, at a time like this, with, with so many challenges facing our local communities, it would have been really easy for you to make a decision to defer this action. So I applaud the council for taking the time to acknowledge those lives lost on September 11th. I know all of our firefighters are extremely appreciative of this proclamation, and I know also the family and friends of the nearly 3,000 innocent civilians who lost their lives during these terrorist attacks. Um, it's a very meaningful gesture from the council, and, and it, it, it doesn't go unnoticed, so thank you very much for that. Um, it is unfortunate that we're unable to have our community gathering on September 11th like we uh, normally do. Um, since we aren't able to get together as a community, we wanted to, to put something out to the community from us. And so we have put together a, a short uh, video to honor uh, 
uh, the lives lost in September 11th. And we will be putting that out on our social media on the 11th. And um, we would love for the city to also share that on your social media after after we release that. So again, uh, thank you for taking the time to, to, to do this proclamation this evening. It, it is very meaningful. We appreciate it. Thank you for those comments. Chief Zaro. Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Um, it, I'll echo uh, Chief Sharp's comments, just uh, appreciating uh, your efforts and remembering 9-11 uh, when clearly there's a million other things that, that you know, are taking priority in our front and center in our lives right now. Um, one thing I'll add is that, you know, the, some of the risks that we saw our first responders take back in um, 2001 we're seeing those same uh, risks being taken today as even as we speak, we have uh, firefighters rushing in to uh, um, protect uh, people's lives and homes from the, the fires that are, you know, we never really envisioned being in our area. Uh, and we have our law enforcement officers side by side with them trying to evacuate people. Um, the risks that our first ref responders uh, face are, are much the same as they were in 2001. So even though we're acknowledging an event that happened um, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, um, it's, it's, the risks are still there. The same risks that they faced then or, or what our first responders face today. So, uh, with that, I just, uh, will thank you again for your acknowledgement and your remembrance. Thank you. And go out and keep us safe. We now move to uh, the next item of business, which is a Clover Park School District report. And we're scheduled to have uh, board member Anthony Velez. And I... Hello there. Welcome. Hello, sorry about the delay. I'm having some issues with getting onto the Zoom. Uh, for some reason, I could hear and see everybody, but could not participate. Um, so I reached out to Marty and somehow now I'm on here. So it's good to see everyone. All righty, so um, let's see here. I guess I can just start from the top. And of course we started this new school year with uh, doing virtual um, and we're using Teams as a daily, um, uh, Microsoft Teams as our platform to, to actually run the programs for, for the students. And that seems to be uh, doing very well at the moment. Uh, there's still a lot of things that, you know, we have to work through, uh, but on the, on the bright side too, uh, we are able to have all of the computers, um, issued out to each individual students that were in need and there was 12,000 and we were able to take care of this over over the summer uh, time period and for any families that were having any issues with um, having wi-fi connections or um, you know te technical issues then we were able to uh, help them with the hybrid um, setup so we were very happy to, to have those results, uh, to have those Wi-Fi uh, locations set up. So that, that was amazing. Um, with the elementary for planning for a hybrid, uh, the district is finalizing plans to move into a hybrid instruction uh, model for the elementary students uh, when it's safe to do so. Um, so this will definitely take some time. It all has to do with the models for uh, COVID and what we're actually looking at. So we were actually just kind of got some new updates this morning that we might be able to make that happen towards the end of September. So that, that's very exciting news um, for, for the elementary students. So um, next would be the virtual learning resources available to a district website. Uh, which is a very good and important website to utilize for, for families and students as, you know, they, they navigate our uh, virtual learning model. So um, I think the, the website's gonna be very, very important. And it was, it's very important for them to be able to see their schedules, um, updates on technology and meals 
uh, links to child care, which is uh, very important too, um, and just other resources for uh, COVID. Uh, so that is all going to be good information for the families. And, and really, we're recommending for families to uh, check in periodically uh, just for any changes throughout, throughout the time period. Um, for kindergarten classes, they begin actually today, September 8th. So um, as they, you know, they, they had their uh, family connection conferences, um, all the teachers for, for kindergartens. And that, that all happened from September 2nd to September 4th. Um, so yeah, today was a, a big day for the kindergartners. Uh, free meals for all students. The federal government extended the waiver allowing district to distribute few free meals to all children 18 and under until December. So that's, that's very good news as well. Uh, meals will be distributed at school and mobile locations uh, following our, our similar setup over the summer. Uh, we encourage families who may be eligible to apply for free and reduced price meals. So with uh, administration updates, the district welcomed new faces and new roles uh, at the administration level. So Brian Lockball is the new deputy superintendent. Uh, Kevin Aikita joins the district as assistant superintendent for secondary schools. Uh, and Christy Smith moved into the role of director of student services. So uh, with three of our elementary schools, uh, we have new principals, uh, Lindsay Oconi Guzzo uh, with four heroes and Angela DeShields with Park Lodge and John Mitchell with Ty Park. Uh, and Steve uh, Seberson is the principal at the newly opened Thomas Middle School. So late start Wednesdays begin September 23rd. So beginning September 23rd, the district will implement one hour uh, late starts most Wednesday mornings. During the, this common time, certified staff across the district will meet in grade level or department teams. Uh, and they will be taking care of review and analyze student data revise teaching strategies and practices and collaborate to improve student, student achievement. So th those are very, very important. Uh, and I think their, their focus is, is right on point with that. So um, uh, additionally, um, they'll, they'll be looking at time and support for students uh, who need it and enrichment for students who are already performing at grade level. So um, being able to communicate and have those uh, uh, there with, with the students is very, very important. Uh, let's see. So the oh for for social media, uh, Clover Park is a uh, school district on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So we're we're trying to make it easy accessible for uh, these apps, uh, so that everybody can stay uh, up to date with uh, with news, announcements, uh, pictures uh, of the students, and and of course the, the staff in action. So so that's very very exciting. Uh, and let's see, we have our future school board uh, meetings coming up, which will be Monday, September 14th uh, at 6 p.m. And then Monday, September 28th at 5.30 p.m. Um, and I think that, that really covers all of our updates. Do, do we have any questions? Questions for Mr. Velez. I have a question, let's see. Mr. Wayland. Thank you. Greetings, Director Velez. Thanks for coming. Hello. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Uh, a question to you, uh, my comment, congratulations on getting up and running. My, my question is, uh, how were you able to nimbly uh, issue uh, iPads or computers to all the students in Clover Park? I was wondering how you guys did so well to pull that off. Uh, you know, I don't know uh, the exact uh, details, but I know with uh, coordinating and looking at the uh, so the records, as far as I understood, with uh, with other students that may have been eligible for free or reduced lunch, uh, mm -hmm. they were able to utilize that data to really make the decision, um, and of course, just uh, reaching out to the families uh, so that they can be taken care of uh, properly. So there uh, does, a does that answer? 
Yeah, I just wondered if there was, because it was an unexpected budget hit probably for the district to have to figure out how to get the tools in the hands of the kids that needed them. I was just wondering how, what the, the budgetary impact was and uh, how that was able to be done so successfully. I, my, I applaud you all for doing it. Right. So I do know there were um, donations made by local companies as well to to help with those efforts. Um, so those greatly made made a big deal for for our community. Any feedback on uh, connectivity issues, things that we might help with regard to our franchise agreement with some of the providers in the area? Um, when it comes to like Wi-Fi connection or actually using Microsoft Teams, is, is that what you're referring to? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, as we as we work through it, I mean, just myself um, actually had difficulties um, and I feel more of a, a veteran using uh, Zoom because I actually even use it for uh, business as well. Um, so, of course, running into those technical difficulties, it, it's there. Um, and I think that's where we're utilizing the website, social media to really be there. Um, and, and I do know that we have IT techs. Uh, they're, they're ready um, to help. Uh, answer these complicating questions and just kind of have that back support. How about the feedback from parents? Are they uh, giving the district decent feedback on how they're managing at home, dealing with maintaining kind of good observation and direction for their children while some of them trying to work? I know it's been a challenge for me as a business owner because people are struggling with dealing with all of it. Right, right. And great question. Um, it's, it's definitely, you know, been a challenge. And I've heard some positive um, remarks, which, which are amazing. I've heard some, some negativity where, of course, it's hard for them to juggle their, their work schedule, trying to be there for, for their children um, with, with schooling. So that, that has definitely been a, a, a huge, huge um, uproar right there. Uh, but on the positive note, uh, I've heard wonderful things to where um, they're able to, you know, you, they see their student and they're actually doing um, a more productive, a more organized, uh, more, more attentive. And, and the parent is able to build that relationship as well, um, more so with uh, teaching them with these different, you know, scholastic subjects. So I, I believe bonds are, are, you know, being utilized in the correct way um, to, to really help and gear it. Mm -hmm comfortable uh, comfortable uh, part of this too is that you're at home so you can kind of set up a workstation um, and you know from from that perspective I think it's more uh, personable so they're able to really you know get involved and, and find the subjects that, that they're really wanting to to leave for, for their future great well all the best of luck and uh, good wishes to all the students and the teachers in the district thank you thank you very much Mr. Brandstetter. Thanks, Mr. Yeah, so thank you for being here with us today to, to do that. I think uh, the, the entire community, uh, um, how, how schools are, are, are coping is a, uh, is a matter of interest to, to everyone as we're going on. Um, you, you, you spoke about perhaps in the elementary schools to start moving from fully virtual to some sort of hybrid thing with uh, uh, in a, at least in a, in a, in a shorter term uh, uh, if uh, COVID trends continue as they've been. Uh, but I, I, was, I was wondering a couple of things. One is, um, is the district in a position of where you're going to be able to make the decision about doing that in the timelines or is that something that is going to be done regionally and, and with a number of districts doing things simultaneously or being told to do things simultaneously? Excellent, excellent. Yes, I think that is a, a wonderful question to uh, kind of look at what we're, we're battling here. So um, as far as I was told this morning um, through Ron Banner, and, and please don't, don't quote me, this is just my, my um, side of the situation, but we are looking at, um, of course, following the guidelines uh, for what Washington State is going 
to allow us to do. So there are certain numbers that we are having to reach uh, with COVID as far as new um, infections to allow these students to actually open the door for some hybrid um, uh, scheduling. And it, the exciting news is that mm -hmm. we are potentially looking at uh, the end of September. Um, I, I believe it was around the neck of the woods of September 21st, September 25th. Um, but of course we will know uh, further information um, a, as time progresses and we get authorization. So yes, we will see this um, as a regional um, instead of just more of, you know, Clover Park School District as, as a single. I know that um, as, as we've just started the school year, uh, many families have made uh, unique arrangements for this year to be able to deal with the virtual learning to do that. And I guess I would just mention to you that um, one theme of comments that I've heard is that uh, they'd like to get some notice if the, if the system is going to change to where they have to make some adjustments, something, and folks are hoping to get notice in, to something in terms of weeks rather than in days before they have to shift gears and get used to a new uh, change normal. Um, do that. Uh, if I could go to one other topic, uh, I was wondering that the, the Claudia Thomas uh, Middle School is, uh, has opened, uh, didn't really get a chance to have a, a, a real grand opening uh, for uh, something whose uh, school whose uh, namesake is important to the community in many ways. Um, so I, I'm hoping that that, that will be uh, uh, done in the future. But I also note that the, the district also went in and is asking to actually have to add modular classrooms to the campus. Uh, mm -hmm. It, what occurred that, that the building that we built and are about to move into is now deemed too small? Thought it was being built with excess capacity. <laughs> right, right, which the school is beautiful. It's big, um, the latest technology. Uh, it, it seems like one of the uh, you know, up-to-date schools in, in the area uh, from, from my perspective, but when it comes to that other facility needed um, next to the football field, um, I cannot remember, and I can get back to you if you'd like on, on this subject, um, but they, I believe it was for more of a, like, like hands-on, it was an additional part um, uh, from the school itself. So yeah, not, not quite sure, 100% what those portables were for, but. Um, they did have the discussion during, during the walkthrough. So um, I could get more specifics on that for you if, you if you'd like, sir. It's not so much that you need to do to me, but I guess I would suggest to you that, that, that you need to do a good job of mentioning the reason for that to the community. Because okay. uh, generally putting portables on a school site seems like a red flag to some in the community sometime about uh, investment. Uh, but, then, but anyway, but th th thank you for being here and, and please thank uh, your, your, your colleagues for the, the great work that, that they've done to, to transition to this particular school year. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we, we appreciate that as a, as a whole. Uh, thank you very much. Any other questions? I just note that uh, Ron Banner came, uh, well, as much as you come virtually, to uh, Coffee with the Mayor this morning, presented some of the same information. He indicated, and I'd seen this as a, side, as a sidebar, that uh, the public school superintendents in Pierce County uh, reached an informal agreement that they'd wait until September 21st and uh, see what the impact of Labor Day 
uh, was on the COVID trends uh, before they make a decision, then it's up to the individual districts in the, they'll collaborate with each other, but it's up to the individual districts to decide whether they want to open and what their exact plan is. Uh, he also mentioned that, uh, as I think when uh, a question was asked about the delay for not uh, advance notice that they have an MOU with the uh, Clover Park Education Association that requires a one week notice so they can get their childcare finalized before uh, they uh, go back into the classroom. Though about well, one third of the staff is, he said, is now working from the school as opposed to working from home. So it was quite informative and it was great to have him there this morning. Oh, if there aren't any further questions, well, thank you, uh, Director Velez, and uh, keep up the good work for our kids in the community. Thank you very much, sir. We, we appreciate that, and I do as well. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. We now move to public comment. I would note that uh, we have a public hearing uh, tonight, too, on the uh, fireworks issue, and if you wish to have your comments uh, uh, of record for the public hearing, that's when you should make them, but it doesn't prohibit you from also making comments uh, during the public comment section of the program. Uh, we are now uh, moving to public comments, which are in this COVID environment accepted by mail, email, or by live virtual comment. Send comments in advance by mail or email to Brianna Schumacher, city clerk at 6000 Main Street, Lakewood, Washington 98499. You see on your screen, you can also uh, call in uh, at 1253 215 8782 and enter participant ID 868 2373, which is the Zoom ID. Comments were received. Uh, before the meeting and up to one hour before the meeting, they have been provided to the city council electronically. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you indicate, I know we did receive some comments. You might read the names of those uh, com commentators, please. Mayor Anderson, we did not receive any public comments. The comments that were provided to the city council were part of the public hearing related to fireworks, which we'll address. Um, okay, later. excuse me. Uh, I'm getting way ahead of myself. You're right. Thanks for the correction. So those were uh, no, no comments were received in advance. If you'd like to make a virtual public comment, please uh, sign in as indicated. Upon entering the meeting, enter your name or other chosen identifier and use the raise hand feature to be called upon. When you are unmuted, please provide your name and city of residence such as Mary Moss, Lakewood, Washington. Each speaker will be allowed three minutes to speak. Uh, outside of the public comments, all attendees on the Zoom meeting will continue to have the ability to virtually raise their hand, see and hear the meeting, but will not be able to speak after their testimony in public comment is completed. Uh, do we have anyone signing in, Madam Clerk? Mayor Anderson, we have a Mr. Dennis Haugen who was signed in to speak. All right, call on uh, Mr. Haugen from South Dakota. I've asked Mr. Haugen to unmute his microphone. It appears that, it, that his microphone is still muted. There, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm Dennis Haugen from uh, the state of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I'm a voting citizen here. I had to show my driver's license and my uh, social security number before I could get a citizenship here and be able to vote. <clears throat> But ever since I left Washington, and I realize this is this falls down from Seattle, but it'll eventually roll down to you and the suburbs as is 
some of the violence that's going on is what is happening. It rolls down to the suburbs eventually. And you've been on the news, the national news daily, weekly, daily. And you're the talk of the nation. And I realize it started in Seattle, but there's, a, there's an incompetent understanding of the law as I, as a, you know, not being a lawyer, understand rioting, looting, arson, and murder is not the same as legal protesting. But it seems that you have elected officials who don't understand the seriousness of what's going on, or you'd move to stop it. So there are people across the United States who've been doing this and can, you can consult with them and they'll tell you how to stop it quickly and immediately. You won't do this in my town. No, and there's a lot of other cities you won't do it in, but you're lucky. You have an election coming up. It's time for you to say you're fired. You're fired to certain elected officials. And in my opinion, it start to stop top with your governor. Work your way down to Inslee, work your way down to Denny Eck. Work your way down to Kilduff and Levitt who voted for sanctuary statehood. The border has to be airtight with what can come through nowadays. Just keep on going down to Monica Morgan Conroy. Fire the whole bunch of them. If you can't do that, then get yourself some pajamas that are fire retardant and go to bed with a fire extinguisher because you'll never know when a rock will come through your window, or put some chicken wire on the outside of the outside of the window to stop the rocks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Are there any more folks signed up out there? Mayor Anderson, we have a Mr. Chaz Ames signed in to speak. Okay, Mr. Ames. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is Charles Ames of the city of Lakewood here in Washington. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members, I'm disappointed that the freshman council member was absent for nearly a month. And if the Deputy Mayor can call in for meetings, then that seems that should be the standard. Is that your comment, Mr. Ames? Yes, sir, that is all. Anyone else out there, Ms. Schumacher? We have an individual identified as Galaxy Note 9. Sounds like a device, but I'm sure they can identify themselves. Absolutely, it's Craig Chambers from uh, Lakewood, Washington. Am um, I coming through there? Yes. Perfect. I apologize. I uh, I did sign in uh, with the note. The, it put the device name there. Uh, just just commenting in on the uh, fireworks uh, that we're discussing tonight. Uh, I know that's pretty important to my family and I and our kids. Uh, we enjoy the fact that Lakewood keeps that legal. I know we have a lot of folks out there that are not quite following the rules and and uh, uh, igniting things that shouldn't be, that are causing issues for the fire department, police department, whatnot. Uh, just putting my comments, uh, hope that uh, you guys can sway in keeping that legal. And maybe if uh, I, I'd be a fan of, of, of increasing penalties as far as for those that, that can't seem to follow the rules or giving us a, a, an ability to report those that can't. But uh, keeping that legal and being able to, to celebrate, uh, you know, the 4th of July, 
for me and my family, very important. Uh, I, I sure enjoy that. And I've got a, a three-year-old and a five-year-old that I'd like to be able to stay at home and keep them safe and, and enjoy fireworks uh, for myself and, and for my children. Um, that's pretty much the end of it, but I just, uh, just wanted to put in there that, uh, that that's something that's important to me. And I'd, I'd sure hate to see that change. Uh, I understand that the safety uh, aspect that goes into um, making fireworks illegal, um, but just hoping that maybe there's another way to go about it to, to, to protect our, our community and ourselves and, and be able to continue that tradition. Right. And that's the end of uh, the comments for me. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Checking again with the city clerk. Is there anyone else in the queue? We have an individual identified as Laura Burt. All right. Keep that up. Ms. Burt. Hi there. This is Laura here in Lakewood. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you for taking my comment. This is regarding the fireworks. I do appreciate having fireworks available to the public for 4th of July and New Year's Eve holidays. And I'd like to continue that, but I'd like to see some sort of uh, policing or regulation around fireworks discharged on other times of year because they're extremely disruptive to communities that have uh, members who suffer from um, illnesses that require them to have peaceful evenings. And I can say for my neighborhood over by Fort Silicon Park, we have had consistent discharge of fireworks almost nightly beginning in May of this year. And um, it's been extremely disruptive to the neighborhood. The fireworks don't sound to me like legal fireworks, but I don't know for sure. Um, they're extremely loud and they do disturb all the families in the neighborhood that I have spoken to about it. So I just wanted to let you know that it's a concern for me and my family and others in our neighborhood. And that's the end of my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Schumacher. No one else has raised their hand indicating they'd like to provide public comments this evening. Yes. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, we actually just got one in from Amelia Escobedo. Is Escobedo. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Amelia Escobedo. I am a Lakewood, Washington resident. I am calling in for the fireworks, and I would say I am okay with the standard that we have now for the third, fourth, and fifth of July. I think that's awesome. I do not like it when it's any other day. I was in the military, so when I do hear them go off, I have PTSD, so it does scare me a little bit. So I said, so any other days besides those days, I don't believe they should be popped. Uh, I will have another comment that is not for that, but I don't know if I'm allowed to do it right now. Yes. Okay. So I um, sent an email in, but I got domain failure, but I'm just going to read this uh, verbatim. Hello, my name is Amelia Escobedo. I'm currently attending the University of Washington. I am pursuing my bachelor's degree in political science. I'm a veteran of the U.S. Army, and I serve one tour in Afghanistan, so I know what it means to serve my community. I currently live in Lakewood, Washington. It has come to my attention that the memo written by the Lakewood Police Department is mis misleading. In a memo published August 11, 2020, and this is verbatim, what the data shows is that LPD has used a relatively equal probation of force to arrest across all, forces, all races. And this is from the use of force and demographics memo done by Police Chief Mike Farrow. The population of Lakewood is 61,037, according to the 2019 census. 12.5% of the population is black, yet 35% of the arrests with the use of force were against black Lakewood community members. Today, I stand with you to tell you that it is critical, critical to organize and end the systematic racism that runs throughout our Lakewood Police Department, Lakewood City Council. The reason I am writing it is to inquire for the removal of Mike Wiley, Mike Zaro, and Byron Mike, Brian Mike Hart from the Lakewood Police Department. We need... <clears throat> Um, that's my place. 
I'm just going to go for a little bit too. Uh, after being found guilty in the Leonard Thomas case, the officers have been allowed to serve the Lakewood community. Mike Wiley is currently on paid leave due to the Syed working case. Our community needs body counts on all officers, not just vehicles. We need accountability for the deaths of Syed, Daniel, and Leonard. Money will never bring back the lives that have been silenced. How many more deaths will our Lakewood City Council and Police Department allow? Not one more is what I say. Say his name, Saeed Joaquin. Say his name, Leonard Thomas. Say his name, Daniel Covarrubias. Black lives matter. And if black lives don't matter, then mine does not either. Not one more. Thank you. Ms. Schumacher, is there anyone else? Mayor Anderson, there's no one else signed in to provide comments this evening. Well, call that once more in case someone is trying to sign on. Is there anyone else who wishes to make public comment? Absent some positive indication, I declare public comment closed. We now, I would note that uh, just in a, a little dig toward uh, Mr. Bulky and my uh, daytime employer, the county council has not figured out how to conduct uh, public comment virtually, and we're doing it in a multi-state fashion. So I, I, I commend staff for making this work. Uh, we now move to the consent agenda, Madam Clerk. A, approval of the minutes of the City Council study session of August 10th, 2020. B, approval of the minutes of the City Council meeting of August 17th, 2020. C, approval of the minutes of the City Council study session of August 24th, 2020. D, approval of claims vouchers in the amount of $2 million. $449,342.43 for the period of July 17th, 2020 through August 17th, 2020. E, approval of payroll checks in the amount of $2,415,472.14 for the period of July 16th, 2020 through August 15th, 2020. F, motion number 2020-45 authorizing the execution of an interlocal agreement with the Clover Park School District for the purchase of fuel for the period of September 1, 2020 through August 31, 2021. G, motion number 2020-46, authorizing the execution of the Pierce County Conservation Futures Agreement to fund in Pierce County Conservation Futures Stewardship Agreement and declaration of restrictive covenants to acquire 0.24 acres of land near Wards Lake Park. H, motion number 2020-47, confirming the appointment and authorizing the execution of an agreement with Lisa Mansfield as municipal court judge for the period of October 1, 2020 through December 31, 2021. I, motion number 2020-48, appointing Asuka Luden, Jessica Christensen, Jarnell Singh, and Philip Rashke to serve on the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee through November 1, 2022. And J, items filed in the office of the city clerk. One, Lakewood's Promise Advisory Board meeting minutes of December 5th, 2019. Two, Landmarks and Heritage Advisory Board meeting min minutes of February 27th, 2020. Thank you. Is there any item which any member of the council wishes to have removed from the consent agenda? Seeing none, and entertain a motion. So move, Mr. Mayor. Second. It's moved by Ms. Moss, seconded by Ms. Farmer that we adopt the consent agenda. Is there any further discussion? Will all in favor please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed nay. The motion carries. I would note that one of those items is the uh, confirmation of the city manager's appointment of Lisa Mansfield as municipal court judge starting in October. And I'd hope that we could arrange to have some type of uh, socially distanced uh, ceremony for swearing in where uh, her family or friends could be there. It's kind of a big deal when somebody gets to be a judge. Mr. Caulfield. Um, thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council. And um, actually that uh, online 
online Zoom swearing-in ceremony is scheduled at your next regular meeting on Monday, September 21. Okay. All right, now we move to public hearings and appeals. This is the date for, set for a public hearing regarding the proposed code amendments related to fireworks. Testimony is accepted by mail, email, or by live virtual comment. Comments were received in advance by mail or email and were sent to, which were sent to Brianna Schumacher, city clerk at 6000 Main Street, Southwest Lakewood, Washington, 98499, or at bschumacher at citylakewood.us. Uh, and if those comments were received up to one hour before the meeting, they have been provided to the city council electronically. And I know there were some. Uh, so would you please read the names of the people whose comments we have received in writing? Mayor Anderson, in addition to the comments that were received in your city council agenda packet of September 8th, 2020, starting on page 181, those comments go through page 376. Today, the city council was provided four additional comments via email. Those were from a Mr. Sean Quant, a Ruth Ann Russell, a Malcolm Russell, and an F. Leroy Reed. In addition, today, electronically, you were provided with Facebook um, comments that were written by citizens as of 9 8 2020. Thank you. Now, if you would like to provide live public testimony, you will be, need to join the Zoom meeting as an attendee by calling the telephone number 1-253-215-8762 and entering the participant ID 868-7263-2373 or visiting us by Zoom and entering participant ID or event ID 868-7263-2373 is shown on the screen. Upon entering the meeting, please enter your name or other chosen identifier. Use the raise hand feature to be called upon when you are unmuted. Please provide your name and city residence. Each speaker will be allowed three minutes to speak. Outside of public testimony, all pu attendees on Zoom will be allowed three minutes to speak. Uh, once you raise your, I should say outside the public testimony, you will be able to raise your hand, but you will not be able to speak, even though you can see and hear the proceedings. You will remain muted. Uh, I would note that the uh, principal difference, uh, besides being uh, kept as a record on this particular issue, public testimony in a public hearing is limited to the uh, subject at hand, it's to address the firearms regulations. To uh, kick this off, we have City Attorney Ms. Walker. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor Whalen, members of the council. I'm Heidi Walker, the City Attorney for the City of Lakewood. I think this is the third time that we've brought fireworks before you in this calendar year, but as you are all aware, it comes up about annually. And one of the con uh, disconcerting pieces of fireworks legislation is that whatever the council enacts, it doesn't take effect for a full year and that's because of the way the state law is written. At the direction of the council, we have collected the written comments, Facebook comments, opened this for public input, tried to get as much as we could uh, before the council because our understanding is that the council was very interested in the perspective of the citizens. In a normal public hearing, what we would do is just open it, have the testimony before you, perhaps take some written comments in advance and put it all together before the council. This is a little more of a broad approach. Uh, tonight we have with us uh, Chief Zaro and someone from uh, West Pierce Fire to answer any questions the council may have at this point. But as I've indicated, uh, the council has looked at this a couple times already this year. What we're looking for after the council has had an opportunity to consider public input is direction. We are prepared to go in whatever direction the council deems appropriate. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. And as indicated, there are some folks who are available to answer questions that are more specific to enforcement. Questions from council? I have some. 
Yep. Go ahead. So if, if the chief is there, uh, both Chief Zero and, and Chief Sharp, it might be helpful to lay some foundations that may be of interest to the public in their, their comments. So to Chief Zaro, if he's listening, the question we often get is uh, twofold. One, if we ban, how effective would the ban be based on what we've known? We saw the video that you folks prepared for us that showed fireworks going off in all other jurisdictions. So it begs the question whether restriction or outright ban, how effective would our enforcement mechanisms be through Lakewood Police Department? and whether you would need some additional teeth in your arsenal to make enforcement effective, either restricting or outright banning. Sure, so what, what we've seen is uh, in other jurisdictions where they do have outright bans uh, or severe restrictions, um, there are still plenty of fireworks going off um, and plenty of the kind that uh, are illegal. So, um, what I have heard from some jurisdictions that have had some measure of success in reducing fireworks at different times of the year is that it is a years long process and you have to stick with it every year and have uh, an emphasis year after year to, to drive that, that message home, essentially changing the culture of the city to, to where it's not, um, it's, it's just not accepted, I guess, as, a norm uh, every year. And that's with whether it's an outright ban or a partial restriction. Okay. So then my next question, maybe to both you and to Chief Sharp or whoever is appearing on behalf of West Pierce is related to calls for service, both responding to just the annoyance of fireworks on the part of our police department and or responding to the impacts of fireworks either to property uh, or to persons on behalf, on behalf of West Pierce. So what's been our history over say the last five or 10 years, average calls for service in those two arenas? Well, I'll jump in here first and then let uh, Scott address some of the fire department calls for service. We do see a, uh, an increase in calls for service on around the 4th of July um, and they are not surprisingly, typically for, uh, or fireworks related, but we also see other calls for service related to, um, well, what you would typically associate with, with parties or, or alcohol, just given the nature of, of the holiday and the time of year. Uh, but we do see an increase in uh, calls for service for fireworks. Um, one of the struggles we have is um, we might pass four other illegal discharges on our way to, or four other fireworks discharges on our way to the one that called in. Um, so uh, we do get the calls. It's just a matter of you know, addressing all of them or having an, the ability to address more than just the one that called. So restricting, again, just to you chiefs, are restricting potentially the discharge opportunities to just July 4th and January 1 as recommended by the uh, Public Safety Advisory Committee um, how effective do you think you can be with your narrow focused attention on those two days in terms of responding to calls for service, mostly for health and safety issues, I assume, because they would be allowed those two days. Right. So uh, our focus would probably, I know that on New Year's Eve, that's one of the days that we're looking at as well, but given what the weather usually is on New Year's Eve and around that right. time, that's really somewhat of a non-issue. I mean, it's, okay. it's not necessarily as much of a safety issue as we mm -hmm. see in the hotter months around the fourth. Okay. Um, for us, our, our focus would be on what we change. So if we change things on the third and the fifth, that would be our focus. We would probably you know, re respond as we do now on the fourth, okay. the third and the fifth, because that's going to be where the change is. That's where we would um, have the, the most effort and uh, need the most education and enforcement. Got it. So Scott, what about West Pierce's experience with regard to calls for service over the last few years, both in terms of injuries to persons and or property? And I'm referring to fires or other types of impacts to property. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, uh, very similar um, 
some of the data that we pulled, uh, July, July is always busier than August. Mm -hmm. And then it's usually busier by about a third as far as uh, structure fires, single company response, or just general alarms. And then we also focused on July uh, one through five, um, which is typically very busy because of the 4th of, 4th of July holiday. Mm -hmm. And those uh, call volume days uh, increase another 60% over the normal call volume for July. Mm -hmm. um, so we do see a significant uh, amount of calls uh, increase during that short period of time. We staff with additional units um, this past year over the three day period, uh, July three, four and five, uh, we reported to the uh, state fire marshal. We, in Lakewood, we had uh, 12 brush fires, uh, one with exposures and we did not have any injuries. Um, and that just, it kind of ebbs and flows, you know, certainly uh, weather certainly plays a, a big factor uh, in that as well. Some of the calls, um, we're not always able to determine with some of those brush fires if they are, you know, fireworks related, unless we have somebody right there mm -hmm. telling us there was an ember that fell. And we also don't know if it's a, a legal firework right. or, or not. So um, it is very difficult sometimes to do that, but uh, our call volume does, does increase. Was that last year's data, Scott, on that? Correct, yeah, just this past uh, July. Would you have any comment on whether the data this past year is representative of, say, the past two or three years or so? Just kind of getting a, a sense of the sampling. It's pretty typical, and a lot of it is is certainly weather driven too. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's very very similar. Um, right. July is typically busier, and then that July one through five is increasingly more. Yeah, from a fire danger standpoint, tonight would not be a great night for fireworks displays. No. Uh, quick question for you. Would, does the, the fire department have an opinion or a position on whether they would prefer the city uh, ban altogether or whether they would be fine with the restrictions down to one to two days a year as opposed to the current schedule? So we don't we don't have a stance one way or the other. Um, we uh, we 100 percent will get behind the council and. Uh, support uh, whatever decision you decide to go. We'll we'll make it work. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you both. Any other questions from council? Well, not seeing any. We'll uh, then move to uh, the public testimony of this public hearing. Mr. Mayor, if I could ask the chief a question. Yes, Mr. Bransfetter. Yeah. Uh, Chief, one of the th themes in the comment that we've gotten over the sequence of hearings and even in past years uh, has, al always has to do with uh, uh, the difficulties of enforcement. And the perception out there is that uh, no enforcement can occur unless a police officer actually witnesses a person setting off or discharging a firework uh, and that uh, statements from citizens that they saw someone do it don't result in an enforcement action. Is that uh, perception correct? And is it what is it rooted in? Uh, is it rooted in something that is came from the municipal court or state law or how does that work? I'm not really sure what that would be rooted in. It's not necessarily accurate. Uh, we can take uh, witness statements to determine who's lighting off fireworks illegally, um, particularly if they're lighting them off in a reckless manner where, you know, the, the actual crime would be more than just unlawful discharge of a firework. It would be something along the lines of reckless endangerment or um, reckless burning or something like that. Um, it, it really kind of depends on the circumstance, but in general, um, we can issue uh, or we can take enforcement action um, without, net, without always witnessing it. And, and 
one of the other themes is people are really concerned about a much more prolonged period of fireworks from June until this week uh, that, uh, that goes off, that it doesn't seem like enforcement activity on the days of when their legal fireworks are allowed is, 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 is forms uh, uh, the concern. It's that uh, no matter what we say, that even now that people are looking for enforcement in late June, they're looking for it in the middle of July uh, during the month of August. Um, so to the extent that you would want to go about changing a culture in the community through um, efforts on education and enforcement, um, how, how, do, how do you, uh, how long would you really need to devote some specific enforcement to that? Well, I would say uh, uh, several years, really, until you, you know, the uh, the culture changes or the the message is out there that, you know, if you want to to light off fireworks, the fourth is the day to do it or not at all, depending on what the council decides. Um, it, it is a years long process to um, change that because it primarily we're talking about a couple days out of one month in a year um, that we'd be focusing on, uh, and you know. Come July 10th, most of the time people have forgotten about, you know, what happened on July 4th or 3rd and 5th. So it's going to take, you know, until it comes around again the next year. So you get to that point and you have to do that, you know, year in and year out for a few years before um, it sticks in the collective memories. With respect to a ban on fireworks, is enforcement... easier to facilitate if a ban includes not being able to discharge them, but also includes not being able to possess them? Hmm. Well, I think you'd have to, um, I don't know that that would help our help the cause any. Um, I think the, the possession part, I think the sales part of it um, is something that we, we would want to look at as well um, because it, that certainly sends a mixed message having a fireworks stand in the city and then, right. you know, banning fireworks, but, um, the possession, it could certainly be a part of it. Uh, the, the big package or the, the bigger picture of what we're trying to do. But I, I think the discharge and sale would be our, it should be our primary focus. Okay. And, and then I, I have a, a question for the city attorney. Um, Currently, while we're on holding virtual meetings, uh, there are some restrictions on the type of actions that we could consider. We can consider things that are routine emergencies. Does amending the fireworks ordinance fall within something that is allowed? Uh, or is it something, as we have talked before, that we need to wait until we can have uh, aren't, aren't under those restrictions from the, from, from the state as to the topics of our meeting? I think the council can absolutely take this action. And if anything, the council has gone numerous extra miles to get public input on this one. And it's one for which you could have just put on a regular agenda and changed your code. Right. Uh, it's not actually different than other code changes. It's different to this council, and this council has showed a particular concern with public input and getting a lot of information. It's that deliberation distinguishes it from other types of uh, action that you would normally take. But at its core, legally, it's the same as any other code change you might make. Right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Anyone else? Okay. I have a follow up if no one else does. This, this would be a question for the city manager. Mr. You know, Mayor. Part, oh, go ahead. Mayor, did you have a question? 
Okay. Is it? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief, I was just uh, wanting to ask, you had made a, you made a statement that you could take action from a citizen's complaint. What information would you need to verify that what's happening? Well, an eyewitness, somebody that saw, you know, saw who lit it off, how they lit it off, what, you know, what just uh, it, an eyewitness to the entire event. Okay, so you could take a witness statement because we've been saying, unless you were there, that I have been telling people, unless the police was there to see it happen, there was nothing you could do about it. But this is what you just said. It's a little different. So you would just need to be the person that reported it must be sure to have some identification that, to identify the person directly. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, the, you know, every situation can be different. You can change one variable in, in an incident and um, it can change what we can and can't do. Mm -hmm. um, there are also, you know, enforcement means different things. It can mean writing a ticket. It can mean, you know, arresting somebody or it can mean writing up a report and sending it to the prosecutor's office for review. Um, any one of those things could lead to or be considered enforcement action. So there's, okay. there's a lot of different things that could result from it, but what we would need to start with is an eyewitness. Okay. All right. I think from the comments we've been getting from some of the citizens, that may be easy for them to accomplish. So thank you. Back to Mr. Whalen. Thank you. Uh, just a question directed to the city manager. You know, part of the hundreds of comments we've received, they're, they're kind of divided into camps, the band camp, uh, the go with the uh, recommendation to restrict. And then there's a third category of comments that I've seen, which was uh, ban, but would accept and enjoy a community display. So my question to you is, has your team uh, given much thought or discussion to what a community display could look like and where? Because to me, it, you know, Fort Silicon Park is a location, but it's probably not a great location with the dry grasses that you might see in July 4th, but maybe something around the town center where you got a sea of asphalt might be. I don't know. Have you given much thought to that? Uh, Deputy Mayor Whalen, um, actually we have not. Um, that's, you know, if that's something that the council would like us to look at and look at options and alternatives, including what the what the cost would be, we could um, we could certainly do that. One of the things I would strongly recommend, though, is that um, if there was a display, typical fireworks displays here in the Puget Sound, um, or on the western side of the mountains, for sure, are typically over water. Right. Um, again, I mentioned Fort Stilicon Park and the dry grass and such. So um, I would be uh, uh, cognitive of of. Of, of, of that. So um, doing it over a lake or over the sound or um, something, something like this. But if um, this is something the council would like us to look at, we could um, certainly uh, look at, you know, locations, options, alternatives, and then Got likewise, it. what yeah. the cost would be to put, put on a show. Very good. We probably have some data on costs from Stillicum, but location would be an issue for sure. Yeah, my experience with these types of shows is they can range anywhere from you know, the low end about $50,000, uh, you know, for a, you know, five to seven minute show upwards of a couple of hundred thousand dollars or even larger in terms of what happens in right. uh, Tacoma and Seattle, for example. Thank you. Mr. Simpson. <clears throat> You're on mute, John. Doesn't say you're muted, John, but your mic must not be working. Go to turn the mic on.
So maybe post it in the chat box yeah, if yeah. you could read it. If you could put your put your question in the chat, we'll read it and have it answered. So I think we have the chat disabled. I don't know if that's an okay. option here on this platform. And the other um, option, John, would be to sign out and sign back in and make sure that you turn your mic on when uh, you're signing back in. We'll hold on for a minute for you. The other option is to ask the teenager for technical help. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. exactly. <laughs> I think he was going to that angle pretty quickly. <clears throat> yeah, my 18 month old grandson might manage to reprogram the Roomba and now goes off twice a day whether he wanted to or not. You can program to chase cats, it's even better. Where's John? There he is. There he is. Coming back. He's on mute. There he goes. There he is. No sound. No, we're not hearing you. Okay. I hope this is a good question, Mayor. So he's still attempting to connect here. He's going to call in through Zoom. That way we don't get the cross feedback from my phone into the computer. There we have a six, seven, eight signing in. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Success. Well, I'm sure Charles Ames will be happy now. Now, Mr. Mayor, I have a procedural question. Do we provide in input to the city staff about what direction we're going to go now or was it after the um uh, public comment we're going to do that after the public comment okay that's all i want to ask for now thank you now i'm not going to hang up so i'll just listen this way that's all right it works and then council and we'll move to the public testimony and I've read through that already uh, you know, fun signing in and raising your hand electronically you'll be called on and have three minutes to speak do we have anyone queued up Ms. Schumacher
Mayor Anderson, we do not have anyone who is signed up to speak for public comments. We do not have any virtual hand. For, for testimony? Correct. So if, is there anyone out there who wants to uh, testify at the public hearing on fireworks? Ask again, Ms. Ms. Schumacher, is anyone showing up electronically on your screen? No, they are not, Mayor Anderson. Well, seeing none, I declare a public hearing closed. So now we'll discuss where we want to give some general guidance to the, uh, how we want to give general guidance to staff and what to come back with. And of course we can amend, rewrite that when it comes back, but just where, uh, let's see if there's a consensus as to where we want to start, knowing that this will not be in, would not be in effect until July 4th, 2022. Anyone wish to render an opinion? Mr. Bolke. Mr. Mayor, I just have a, I just have a question. I, I want to, I want to get this right in my, in my mind. What was the public safety advisory committee's recommendation as opposed to the recommendation from staff? Mr. Coffey. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Boki, the recommendation from uh, PSAC was to not make any changes to the code and focus on continued, um, you know, education in terms of what's legal and when it's allowed. Uh, the public hearing before you is based on a recommendation that uh, we brought forward to the City Council, which is to only allow fireworks to be discharged on July 4th which would mean not allowing them on July 3rd and July 5th. And earlier this year, the council uh, directed us to move forward with a, might've been late last year, um, directed us to move forward with um, the public hearing process that we're engaged with right now. Okay. And, and do we know, because it's been a while now and I know PSAC came and talked to us, why PSAC made the recommendation to not make any changes? Um, yeah, yeah, I'd have to go back and look at their report. I think it might be included in your packet or it was included in, in pre previous packets. But they went and through a, a similar process. And why did staff make the recommendation that they made? Um, quite frankly, Councilmember Boki, because this has been an ongoing issue for so many years to do something. And, uh, you know, certainly, you know, based on my, my experience, um, you know, allowing fireworks to be discharged on the date of the holiday makes the most sense. Um, and the complaints that we were mostly getting were not so much on July 4th, but rather on July 3rd or even days before that and July 5th and days after that. And as Chief Zaro pointed out, um, you know, it will, if the council was to move forward with something like that, um, it would certainly take a number of years for, you know, the culture to change in, in, in the community. But um, over a period of time, it, it would it, it would it would occur. Um, so, um, and then as far as why the recommendation wasn't to ban them outright, um, quite frankly, it's because that's just unenforceable. That's just not going to happen. People are still going to go buy fireworks, whether it's um, the safe and sane legal ones, whether it's online, which are typically illegal, or other places. Um, um, where they're also defined as illegal. So it's still gonna happen. And so again, the recommendation is to try and corral it all on the date of the holiday, Independence Day. Good, thank you. And I, uh, you know, I've mulled this over for years now. It's a continuing issue. And uh, I finally rested on uh, kind of the, the least, I, what I think is the least problematic uh, option and that is the staff recommendation of July 4th only or July 4th and December 31st only. Uh, my concern is really a safety one and you know, we have a lot of trees in Lakewood. I've, I've been on a, on a lake watching a professional fireworks display when some Yahoo lit off a tree a couple houses down with illegal fireworks. Uh, that wouldn't have been 
help by this ordinance, but uh, it is indicative of the risk. And if we compress it, I think there's less risk. And I'm honestly afraid that somebody's going to burn Fort Stillicum Park down. Uh, it's a nice open space. Go shoot their fireworks off. And it, and this hard and fast rule is you don't have to determine whether it's legal or illegal. It's very difficult to prove and enforce, but at least from an enforcement standpoint, the LPD could go to places where on July 2nd or July 6th, people are shooting fireworks off in the street and say, stop. Uh, and eventually I think that culture would change uh, to mitigate the risk, not eliminate it. We're not going to get rid of the, the real problem, which is fireworks off the reservations. Um, but we can tone it down and uh, I think save a few structures and a lot of foliage. Anyone else have any guidance? Mr. Whalen. Well, I would concur with. Uh, your comments as well as the staff's recommendation. You know, this is my 11th year on the city council and before that on the planning commission for three years. And this has been an issue every year for the last, I guess, 14 or 15 years that I've been involved in leadership in Lakewood. And so it's, it's high time that we do something. And I think restricting the opportunity for mayhem uh, is a step in the right direction. Uh, I would support Many of the reasons expressed, and I would say half the comments that we received from the public, and certain probably some of the comments from PSAC and others here, that an outright ban in Lakewood is probably not where our residents are from a cultural standpoint. This is a military community. Many people believe very strongly in the opportunity to express their appreciation for patriotism, at least on July 4th and December 31. Every year I ask uh, the chief, as well as the US Pierce reps that are available, what the call for service incidents have been in the prior year. And it, it is similar year after year that we have the occasional brush fires and certainly the increase in calls for service, but we rarely get information on any physical injuries. Not that that's, you know, brush fires and house fires are not a good thing, but I'm just indicating that the, the magnitude of the demonstrated impact, I think, is relatively modest. And I think restricting the display of fireworks will even lessen that impact. So I would support the recommendation. That's a good balance. Mr. Simpson. It's going to have to use your. Uh, your hands you yes. Better. Guess I got to do this. All right. I have to respectfully disagree with you and the deputy mayor. And what I would like to give direction to city staff is a ban on the sale of and discharge of fireworks in Lakewood. And I say this for a number of reasons. Some of these reasons are personal. Others are based on what I have had citizens tell me. My first reason, fireworks scare animals. And pets like mine do not like this at all. And there are a lot of people in Lakewood who have expressed the same sentiment to me. Uh, two, PTSD. I am familiar. And I know a lot of people in this city, the military people that were just referenced, who suffer from this as well. And I would also point out that PTSD does not take a day off. Once you have it, you have it for life. Third, safety. I recall the chair of the Public Safety Advisory Committee saying 
that he and some of the members of that committee favored a ban. However, they went with the recommendation they made very much because they feel that it's unenforceable. We live in a highly populated, dense area. And when that chairman stated to this body that he worries about fireworks coming down on his roof, that makes sense to me. Just like I've worried about them coming down on my roof. It only takes one fire for someone to lose their life. And so I think in the interest of safety, we should ban these. Now, I thought Chief Zaro made a very good point. He said it would take a years long process to change the culture within the city. Now I realize I may sound like I'm comparing apples and oranges here, but it seems to me we did the same thing with the rental housing safety program. We were told and we have followed a two to three year process to make the rental housing safety program the norm. Why can't we do it with fireworks? This is not easy, but I think that we should step up and ban the fireworks and then work to change the culture. This is nothing that's outside the abilities of this city or this council. And so I would respectfully suggest or ask that we consider a ban on the sale and discharge of fireworks in Lakewood. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Brandstetter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I do think that the Public Safety Advisory Committee, with their recommendation, noting that to make a change that's meaningful is going to be have to be done through education. What the chief calls changing the culture of the city, uh, not through enforcement. I am okay with the staff recommendation because it leaves a window of where those who want to use fireworks and who will, uh, there is a time that they are allowed to do that and that's permitted to use the legal firework. My concern with a complete ban is instead of reducing fireworks 364 days a year, it just says, well, if you know the, the, the culture is going to persist if you want to do fireworks, since they're not allowed ever, then I'll do them whenever I want. Whereas leaving a the, the 4th of July, a couple of hours on New Year's Eve to be able to go and do that. Uh, and then you work on getting people to when they do it, to do more with legal fireworks and with illegal fireworks is going to be much easier to change the culture than if you just say, ban it completely. I think the challenge for us as a council is we go to do that. It's not that we pass new restrictions on fireworks and tell the chief to go out and enforce them. Uh, and certainly to tell the chief to go out and mount a program to change the culture. It's that uh, go in with the staff recommendation and change it, or we could leave it as it is now, 
but we do need to invest some resources in changing the culture and of educating folks. Uh, and those, those resources include some dollars so that there can be some dedicated enforcement teams as the city of Tacoma does and uh, has to do that. Yeah. But also we need to use some of our capital and our influence at the state level, state level to get them to get work them. with the tribes to limit the availability of the illegal fireworks that many, many of the comments that we have, those are the types of fireworks that are disruptive to animals that are that, that are, create problems to do that and that are the most dangerous in terms of being a fire hazard. So we need to be working on the, to, to convince the state to be able to make changes at their level through negotiation of the compacts with the tribes to reduce the source of the, the, the fireworks that are the real problem. Uh, so at, you know, at, at this point in time, Mr. Mayor, I, you know, I would suggest that we bring the staff recommended, recommended ordinance back to the council for consideration, uh, but that we don't forget about it when we come to budget considerations and we look at exactly now, how are we going to show that we really mean to take meaningful effort to change the culture and have that reflected in the next biennial budget that we adopt. We don't see any other hands up. What I think from what I've heard, I would suggest that uh, staff come back with an ordinance based on the staff recommendation, one on a total ban, and if there's a second uh, to Mr. Simpson's desire, we can act on that. I think that might be the first first in the order of battle, or whether we want to do a, a complete ban. And also, uh, we haven't discussed it, but we can think about it along the way, independently uh, consider banning the sale of fireworks, which uh, proliferates usage. So then we would have those options available to council to uh, discuss and consider. I think that would cover the what what I'm hearing from council across the board. We'll see where the majority lies. Any other suggestions? Mr. Whalen, you're talking, but you're uh, muted. Now I do my best work when my lips are moving, but you don't hear anything. Um, if we're talking about a proposed portion of an ordinance about banning the sale, but allowing the discharge, are we effectively then telling people go forth and pick up your illegal fireworks at the, the local Indian reservation and bring them into Lakewood and discharge them on July 4th? Or your illegal fireworks around the, the, the tribe sell legal fireworks in addition to the illegal ones, but yeah. um, around the perimeter. Uh, I, I think one thing to consider is if somebody's gonna sell fireworks, what's the market gonna be if it's really only for one day? Right. Well, that's where maybe the education piece on the safe and sane, we used to call them safe and sane fireworks. You know, we used to have snakes uh, for our kids and sparklers, and that was about the extent of it because I was too cheap to buy anything else. So, you know, if we could work on the safe and sane fireworks education uh, and encourage that through licensing vendors who sell nothing but legal fireworks, that might be a good step in the right direction. Yeah. I I was amazed when I moved to Washington as a young teen. I, I had grown up with caps, sparklers, and the little poppers that you throw down on the ground. Right. Yeah. That was it. So snakes are still kind of fun. But, yeah. All right. Uh, it, what, wouldn't, what wouldn't be fun in this environment is smoke bombs, I think. Right. Mr. Caulfield. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Um, 
So uh, we can have these options back in front of you for your review and potential consideration at your next regular meeting, which is September 21, in okay. terms of the, the legal policy issues. The implementation, um, I'm gonna need some time on that probably into early 2022 to kind of really think that through and come back and mm -hmm. share, sh share that with you. I'm sorry, 2021 um, and share that with you. Uh, but we can bring back uh, the ordinance as proposed, um, as well as those two other options, which would be an outright ban on discharge and sale. And then also we can provide some language on if you wanted to modify the ordinance to also either limit or um, ban the sale of fireworks. Okay. Um, I would like to actually, if I could, I would like to point out that the, the, the hearing, the, the public hearings that you have had has really just focused on the ban. And um, so we did not let the community know, particularly those who sell fireworks and most of them are for nonprofits. So they have not had an opportunity to provide feedback and input there as well. So I, I would just point that out as well, Mayor. Well, I think when we're talking about a ban, it's implied that you wouldn't be selling it. So got a lot of comment on on bands. All right, then we'll move on from uh, another. We have a plan on that to resolutions. Resolution number 2020 13, Madam Clerk. Resolution number 2020 13, declaring the intent of the Lakewood City Council to affirm the downtown sub area plan development code and planned action as adopted in ordinance number 695 and ordinance 696. For this we have Ms. Spear. Thank you and good evening, Mr. Mayor. Tiffany Spear here. Um, I will just quickly refer you to page 377 of your memo packet this evening, the meeting materials. And you'll see there just a summary of the fact that you had a study session on August 24th regarding this topic. And the decision at that point was to request a resolution that affirmed all of the uh, requirements and uh, processes that were in place adopted in ordinances 695 and 696. So that is in front of you this evening. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Questions for Ms. Spear. Entertain a motion on the resolution. So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Whalen, seconded by Mr. Bulky that we adopt resolution number 2020-13. Is there any further discussion? Will all in favor please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Now move to unfinished business. Is there any unfinished business to come before the council? There is none, Mayor. We move to a new business. This is a discussion regarding coronavirus relief fund allocations. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, we have another uh, $875,000 uh, slated to come from the state. I don't know if uh, Mr. Caulfield has been received yet, uh, but to be used for coronavirus uh, relief uh, under the restrictions both of the federal government because it's originally CARES Act money and whatever stipulations the state passes on because it comes from their allocation. One of those is I think we have to spend it by the end of October. Uh, and things, though things change daily, we thought we'd want to get this on uh, the docket because there is a uh, difficulty in throughput in getting the, you know, we, all we try to save our money and be very judicious about the way we spend it. This is a use it or lose it bet aid for our, our community coming from the federal government and we have to get it where it's supposed to go to, in, to the beneficiaries. Um, the city manager suggested that we have uh, nearly and probably a little over $300,000 in direct costs uh, that uh, can be reimbursed. Uh, there are items that were reimbursed to the city 
uh, out of this fund. Uh, these are items which were not budgeted, which is one of the CARES Act's uh, requirements, uh, such as overtime for emergency management, uh, doing work to make things uh, more COVID safe and the like. Um, and so first I'd like to ask John Caulfield to uh, speak to that element of it and then go to what other elements that we think might be the best use in that short time period for our uh, community. Thank you, Mayor. Actually, if it pleases the council, our strategic planning manager, Tiffany Spear has a very brief presentation regarding the use of the $1.79 million to include our recommendation on how some of these monies can be used. And, and, and you're right, Mayor, um, the city so far through about mid-August has incurred personnel costs specific to COVID-19 totaling a quarter of a million dollars. And we expect it to be at least $300,000 by the end of October. And so we would strongly recommend that the general fund be reimbursed for those costs. It is allowed under both you know, the state process, but more importantly, it's allowed under federal US Treasury law, which we're all ultimately required to follow. Um, but with that, I know um, Ms. Spear, if she's on the line, um, I'd like to call upon her and I know she'd like to share the screen and just do a real quick walk through, talk through with you, if that again, pleases the council mayor. Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll share my screen just a moment. Maybe I will. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so as you're well aware, in May, the governor uh, distributed $1.79 to uh, the city of Lakewood for CARES, coronavirus relief fund use. And the criteria that were put in place by uh, Treasury and then Commerce and reinforced that was they are necessary expenditures due to COVID. They were not accounted for in the budget as of March 27th of this year. And they were incurred between March 1st and October 31st. So that process has been ongoing since the council took action. Uh, and uh, for the last few months, city has been implementing what was enacted in resolution 2020 slash 11. Uh, both those funding priorities that were identified in the budget that the council directed. Then this last week or a little over a week ago, August 31st, the state announced a second round within the same program. And that has resulted in a distribution of another 895,000 to the city of Lakewood. These funds are allowed um, to be used per the same criteria as the first round. There's um, been notification that, <clears throat> excuse me, there may actually be another month to spend these, but we're waiting on final affirmation of that by uh, the Department of Commerce. They need to send out some guidance documents. So going back to what's been done with the first round, just so the city council is aware of the final details, 80% of what was dedicated from the first round went to quote external uses. So public partners, the business assistance program with small grants and then human services. And then in the internal side, what was spent today was 20% of that first round. Um, there was technology expenditures to allow for remote working as well as um, making the buildings and facilities more COVID safe. There was the facilities and PPE, personal protective equipment purchases made to date. And then there are some additional facilities costs which are pending and there's some dollars left for that. So when looking at how to spend this new round, uh, whether it's October 31st or November 30th, um, a couple of things are recommended to you. As the city manager just mentioned, uh, the $300,000 for payroll costs as of August 31st, that amount was at actually 266,205. So we fully expect it'll be at at least 300,000 by the end of October. Um, looking at potentially allocating up to 250,000 for some additional improvements to the city facilities, in particular, the HVAC systems, um, and then some additional PPE, and that's not just masks and sanitizers, that's things like uh, more permanent signage, um, some additional barriers or stanchions for separating people at events should those start to happen with more frequency, those types of things. And then there would be the remainder and those could be used uh, perhaps the same uh, way with those priorities set in the first round, or there may be other things that the council would wanna consider given the fact that there are now either through Pierce County or nonprofit providers, other sources of rent relief, for instance, or other types of business relief. Um, so where does the city want to best spend those remaining funds? So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Mayor, for a discussion with council. 
Yeah, well, before I start, I'd just like to uh, say, uh, Ms. Spear made a good point. I think uh, one of the things we need to do is coordinate with other sources. And for example, uh, although uh, the, uh, there are a lot of things that you could do for schools, uh, schools got direct payments of CARES money, ACT money. That's where a lot of those computers come from. Uh, they also got uh, a boatload of PPE from uh, County's CARES Act funding, enough to get them started. And it's also considered a requirement of basic education. So it's really the state's responsibility to continue what they, what they need uh, to hold school. Uh, on the rental assistance front, uh, countywide, Tacoma did, we did a little of ours, county, uh, we're talking residential, the uh, Tacoma did some, this, there's now been two tranches at the county, uh, one out of county funds, one out of state funds, which come to about $14 million. There are currently over 4,000 applicants, only a handful are being rejected. That's probably subscribed that, that will probably get additional allocations of funds that are available countywide. And one of the byproducts of our um, rental uh, inspection program is that the city manager was able to give Pierce County uh, Human Services uh, a list of every registered rental in Lakewood so that people, landlords could be contacted. And that has, uh, I think when the, the dust settles, we'll see that Lakewood fared very well on rental assistance being paid directly to landlords, although there's a, a still a pent up need. One thing um, that uh, is oversubscribed uh, both at the county and city level is commercial rent. Uh, we've, it's been reported that the commercial landlords have generally renegotiated leases, but we've got people out there who uh, mom and pops signed a longer term lease, business failing, or just teetering on the edge, they're on the lease for a long period of time as individual guarantors. So you've got a business that's gonna, can go out of business losing uh, employment for employers, the mom and pop owners who are personally on the hook for the lease deficiency and a landlord who doesn't give money. So I think this is my, my before I kick it to you, I, my, my top pro priority would be more of the same in our commercial uh, lease category uh, so that uh, we can get multiple beneficiaries from that money. And it seems to be an area that has a lot of need uh, and isn't as sympathetic uh, in the public eye so that uh, as people getting evicted. So uh, it's, it's probably not gonna get huge amounts of additional state money, we'll get some. So with that, I kind of open the floor for folks, uh, raise your electronic hand and see if we can reach some sort of consensus. So the idea being we might even be able to move it along tonight uh, because the sooner we do this, the so sooner staff can do their good work because the, you know, the wheels of bureaucracy are, are greased, but uh, they still certain, kind of turn some kind of slowly. Opinions from council? Yeah, Don. Mr. Whalen? A couple of questions. I guess one of the city manager with regard to the uh, potential allocation for overtime charges. What were those money or what were those hours typically charged for? Um, Deputy Mayor Whalen, it's actually not just overtime, it's actually regular time that city employees um, were doing in support of COVID 19. Uh, for example, uh, first of all, I'd like to recognize um, Ms. Spear. She has been um, a serving point and the leader of our team and the uh, distribution of the $1.79 million has been doing an outstanding job on it. So the time that she has, for example, devoted to this would be a part of that. Likewise, members of her team, our economic development manager, Becky Newton, um, our human services coordinator, um, Brian Humphreys. Um, but then going back to March and April, um, when we were in more of an operation, op <clears throat> emergency operations mode, um, you know, it was police, public works, a lot of key staff 
uh, you know, we, that's what we were doing pretty much for four or five, six weeks was COVID-19 related activities. So that's, that's where that would come from. It's just not overtime. It's also regular time as well that we were dedicated not to our regular job, but rather um, COVID-19. So I guess the question is to the extent the regular job didn't get done uh, or didn't get done as effectively as it might have had we not had COVID-19 impacts, you know, where do we best direct those resources? Uh, you know, I hear on the street that uh, it, it's taking time to get permits done uh, a little bit. We're open for business, get that. But if there was an opportunity to direct funds to ensure that we have adequate and full staff in that area as we come out of COVID to ensure that we have the best opportunity to get our business feet uh, up and running, I would be supportive of that. Um, go ahead. I was gonna say, first of all, if you have somebody who has a problem getting permits, please let me know so I can follow up with that. Um, uh, 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 but more importantly, we, you know, even though we've been focusing on COVID-19, you heard me saying this back in, you know, March, April, May, and June, um, you know, we did not meet a, we did not skip a beat in terms of doing our day jobs as well. So not only did we uh, allocate resources in support of COVID-19, we are still doing our proverbial day jobs. Um, well, I appreciate that. And that, that's why I guess I'm having a hard time noodling around the thought if there wasn't overtime that we should be covering, which would normally have come out of the city budget, but we were you know, just well, doing yeoman's work at our job well, day to day. Remember now we have salaried employees, for example, as the city manager. So I don't work 40 hours a week, but Got I can it. certainly charge off time to COVID-19. Meanwhile, it. I'm still working during other hours doing regular city business and getting those things done. And yeah. likewise, that also pertains to my staff as well. So social service wise, is, is uh, Mr. Humphreys given us any indication that there are certain areas of need that have been as yet unmet that we might help leverage dollars to reach more people? Um, actually, I would um, direct that question to Ms. Spears. She might have uh, better information on that. I know that um, he has been talking with everybody that has been part of community collaboration, getting their feedback and input on that. But um, Ms. Spear, do you have anything to add to that? Um, just briefly, there was an initial amount of money allocated to human services. And then we actually added a little bit more once we saw the amounts that people were requesting through the business assistance grants, we had a little more extra. And mm -hmm. so we assigned that over to childcare services specifically because right. we'd heard from various and sundry sources that that was a need. So um, there's been additional loans put out for child service providers. Um, one thing though from LASA, which was the largest by far human services contract awarded, they're actually having difficulty at their end spending the funds because they don't have the resources to distribute it out as they say they were going to. Yeah, so yeah. the idea of putting more money toward an organization yeah. that may not be able to handle what they've got so far may not be the best way to go. Um, as in terms of the types of services though, yes, we've kind of covered the gamut of what it is uh, that, that we're hearing is needed. Okay, I, I would echo the mayor's comments on commercial landlords needing some backfill assistance because they are getting hammered with regard to rent deferral requests and uh, the challenge they have with their own mortgage companies paying their bills while commercial tenants are having a hard time paying rent. So that may be an area where we can provide assistance. That's it for me. Oh, Mr. Brandstetter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I too think that we would, we want to take a look at a block of money to go towards the commercial rental costs, both to landlords and to, and to businesses. Uh, I think that from what I've been hearing, that is the number one stressor for many small businesses about whether they survive or not. Uh, and, and they all have different relationships with their different landlords, some of whom are working very cooperatively and others who are just reading the words on the lease. Um, with respect to uh, 
the city's personnel costs, uh, I understand that there are employees that had to reprioritize their work to be doing things that related to COVID-19. But to the extent that they did those within their within changing what they were doing in regular hours, which were the hours that they were budgeted for, uh, I'm not thinking that I would really want to spend money extensively in that regard. I certainly would like to recoup anything that we had to do for COVID-19 that resulted in a overtime or something that was beyond what was budgeted for, for, for an employee, which I would assume then that would bring us to a number less than 300,000 uh, that we can, can, can look forward to, to, to doing that. Um, one other area that I just like to explore uh, because I don't know the answer, but we talked about that the schools had a good number of sources of, of, of money to make those transitions to do that. But I'm not sure that that same ability extended to the small number of non-public schools, such as St. Francis Cabrini, of whether they have got uh, uh, something that is that, that, that they might need some assistance to keep the education of those elementary school students on a par with uh, their peers elsewhere in the city. Um, there may or may not be something uh, something there to 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 do that, and then uh, on some of the nonprofit providers that have had to spend money to readjust their delivery of either English as a second language or GED instruction for adults uh, within the city to be able to continue those programs during the pandemic. Uh, that may be an area that is on the social services side worth looking at. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Bokey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a couple of things I think we should look at is uh, Director Velez earlier talked about uh, helping the students with the hot spots. And I don't know that I understood what a hot spot was. It basically is a little thing that they have that helps them download. I don't know how well it works. But what I would like us to look at is maybe asking some not-for-profits that provide a uh, space for kids to study and whatnot. And that would be both the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club. Those are the first two that come off my mind. I don't, there might be others that would improve their Wi-Fi access? Do they, do they need better Wi-Fi service or is there something that we can help them with in that regard? And then um, I, I think we should continue at least for this month uh, to maybe pursue the childcare part that I think uh, Tiffany just mentioned a, mi a minute ago. Um, that is a supremely difficult problem uh, with when the schools did not open and really left a lot of parents in a very, very difficult situation. So um, I would be interested in pursuing that. Um, I, I, I do believe um, that the city should charge for its COVID time. I think most, most folks are. Uh, we should certainly charge for our one-time costs um, and I, I'm okay with that as long as it doesn't use up the whole the whole pod. Although I, I am concerned about the next layer that we, we talked about there, I, and I can't remember it. Um, there's the first layer, the three hundred thousand, and there's another layer. Uh, maybe we want to pursue some discussion around that layer. Um, that would make more money available for some of these other projects. Thanks. Ms. Farmer. I too am in full support of the staff recommendation for um, charging for COVID time. 
This is something that's happening at the state and other local governments. And uh, my hat is off to staff for, for as John said, not skipping a beat and doing doing COVID in addition to the day job at all hours. And so it's it's just been it's just been incredible. So um, I'm curious. I know that you guys are hearing a lot of recommendations, and so I have a I have a question. Were there any folks in the business business assistance lottery? that didn't get funded were completely shut out because it was a lottery. So if there were, if there were folks who didn't get anything during the lottery, I'd be interested in, in knowing what, how much, how, 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 you know, if that would be a part of it. I'm also in support of childcare and uh, commercial rent as well. It's, um, it's not sexy, but it's a big deal. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I, couple of comments. One on the, um, the hot spots. I know there's been a lot of uh, discussion with respect to rural school districts uh, where they, they don't have the infrastructure to provide uh, good internet access for their students. We're in an urban area and I think Comcast even has a program to give away uh, internet access to low income families for this purpose is on a charitable basis. Uh, and so, and I know that the, the district has previously mapped the existing hotspots, such as a uh, Starbucks park, uh, parking lot and, and such so that people could go to uh, Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, so I don't, I, I question, I guess, whether there's a real need. There's a need, but whether there are any gaps that we would be able to find and fill. Um, the another issue that came up was the aid to schools. Uh, the county's aid to schools was very specifically to all schools, anything that's accredited, public and private, parochial. Uh, and so uh, that was allocated based on a uh, per capita basis with a floor uh, at certain levels so that uh, even the smallest district got a, uh, or school got a minimum. Uh, and so uh, they, they didn't miss that. Yeah, th those schools did not get state funding to schools, but they were eligible for uh, PPP money, like Bellarmine could get a loan to protect its employment uh, as a business, not to run its program per se, but the, the, uh, the uh, parochial schools were eligible for PPE, for forgivable grants. And uh, I think St. Charles, and I didn't remember seeing uh, St. Francis Cabrini on the list, but I'm sure it was because they all, all applied. Um, one idea on the city uh, reimbursement may be if, if we see different tranches or a, a cut line for, uh, as far as council views, some more worthy of reimbursement than others is to hold that in reserve because you can make that transfer or part of it the last day it's eligible. Uh, so if our the council's design, you know, just picking numbers out of the air, not a suggestion, but numbers out of the air. If the number was 300,000, we say we, we, we take 150,000 as uh, partial reimbursement to the time spent to the city. We allocate the rest. And at the end of the day, what isn't spent goes toward the other 150, because that's a check you can write at the last minute. Just a thought. So I don't know we're any any closer uh, than we were, except there seems to be a pretty strong consensus on commercial rent. Uh, there um, there hasn't been a suggestion to provide additional funding to food banks. I. But I'm pretty good authority that they're well funded. Yeah. Uh, that's a been a priority for a, a number of nonprofits in addition for the government entities. Mr. Caulfield. Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Um, 
you know, I was kind of taking some notes here and I think I might have been able to uh, get all of council's comments. And maybe if we just go down these one by one and see where the council consensus is, is on this and then we can move forward if that, if you think that's a good idea, Mayor. I, I think yeah, you're much more organized at this point than I am. So why don't we- Well, I don't, I don't know about that, but uh, <laughs> let, me give, let me give it a shot. Um, so the, the, the first one- Take our stream of consciousness and implement yeah. it. So, uh, and, uh, so the first one would be providing funding in support of commercial landlords and tenants. And okay, I'm seeing thumbs up and head nods. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the next one, and again, these are in no particular order. The next one is private schools, providing funding in support of the private schools here in town. Hey, um, John. Yep. I'm going to send you the link to the ordinance that the county council passed. Okay. Cabrini got 25,000 and Lakewood Lutheran got 5,000. Okay, so do we want to move on from private schools or do you still want to have that on the table as an option? And they got PPE. Oh, yeah. And th th this is just from the most recent one that the council passed last week or eight on 826. So, yeah, anything they got prior to that on the distribution of PPE would be in addition to w what they're specifically being given on this. And the school just in Clover Park got 400 and something thousand. But anyway, it's on the way, John, to you. So you can send it out to the members. Thank you. Just helping you out. Appreciate that. Yeah, I think we should move on. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next, so uh, the next item would be, um, you know, hotspots in, in support of some of our nonprofits where uh, you know, children and young people tend to congregate, you know, the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Club to see what kinds of needs they might have, whether technological or others or other needs, because we don't know. We might not know. Yeah, we can check it out. I think uh, doesn't Lakewood, the, the Y, which was one that was mentioned, I think, I believe has uh, fiber optic, doesn't it? So they upgraded. Yeah, so. yeah, we got that for them a couple of years. My first or second or here. I remember that being a big issue. Yeah, I remember that. That's right. Yeah, good memory. Um, okay, so I saw a majority of folks either nod or give thumbs up. So I'm just, yeah. All right. Um, next up was child care. Um, and uh, okay, a lot of thumbs up on that. Thank you. Um, next is um, funding and support. Oh, I'm sorry, Mayor. Tiffany was waving. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A clarification question for that one, Mr. Mayor. When you say that, are you talking dollars directly to families or dollars to child care providers? Yeah, good question. Um, good, good question. But, uh, yeah, so just, child care providers because they're the ones that have been the variety of aid programs for, for individuals. And if they're working and need the child care, they're going to have an income stream. The, the people that have been most devastated and are disappearing are the child care providers who couldn't make it through or are hanging on by a shoestring. So I guess, personally, I'd like to see us help sustain the capacity or nobody has a place to take the kids. And at least 20, what, you read at least 20% of them are out of business. Yeah. What have you done so far, Tiffany? There's been about 10 child care providers contacted uh, and provided initial grants of up to $2,000, which could be used for PPE or payroll. And so I guess our first step would be to go back to those same 10 to say, hey, do you need more? Um, these were all contacts through Mr. Humphreys and his human services uh, network. Uh, the other way to do it would be to go back to the drawing board and try to locate some other businesses located within the city who provide those services. Well, and they might also need some of that commercial rent assistance that is, it looks like that we've have a consensus to help on. So maybe that's one of the groups that we should include in the commercial rent assistance right up front. It's an idea. Um, so then moving on. So uh, then the I would not want to Forget about the significant percentage of child care providers before COVID that were home-based uh, and a 
looking at them to see what they need to do to keep as close to their original capacity as it is prudent under the COVID thing to do that. Uh, and they're a little bit harder to reach, uh, but, but they've all got business licenses and can be uh, looked at. And there are some of them included in the current um, grant recipient crowd. So I know that uh, Brian Humphreys looked at both home-based and um, commercial rented spaces for childcare. And I believe there's public access to the, uh, the, the list of licensees, uh, state licensed daycare, so that people can go check on that. So we should be able to find access to that. The next one that I have on the list, again, in no particular order, are city personnel costs. And perhaps the way of handling that would be, that would be the last money out um, in the latter part of October or November, whenever we get confirmation in terms of when these monies have to be used by. Because uh, the and the reason I say that is because Commerce's website says October 31st, but the governor did say November 30th. And uh, so we're still trying to track that. I. I I'm going to think the governor is right, and it's November 30th. Um, but again, um, the the use there would be whatever money is left over um, after we kind of go through all of these um, opportunities. We could then use that to draw down to uh, pay back uh, the city. So I guess I'm a little hesitant to leave it so vague whatever money is left over. I think we, yeah. we could do a pretty good job spending that money. So uh, I, yeah, we, we could, we, we could if there were that's right, Councilor Farmer, you know, and because we could submit a request right now for $266,000. And actually that would be as your city manager, that's my recommendation. Yeah, that's, I, 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 I am tending toward more of the full 266. That would be, that's my preference. I was more in the line of something in the neighborhood of 150 and the rest held to as a place to flush the money at the end. But. Well, I, I think we need to understand it in the context of we might still be having cuts in the general fund. And if we're talking about cutting in the general fund, we, we, we really do need to backfill the general fund for spending money that's actually outside of our budgeted levels. Well, you know, while we're trying to save money and we're not filling positions, not using money that is available to, to, to backfill for something that the federal government is willing to pay for and has said that they're willing to pay for it if it's COVID related is, is I think fiscally prudent. And I'd like to point out that when we did this first round, the, the staff recommendation was for a larger amount to be spent internally and a lesser amount externally. And the council turned that around on it, flipped it completely opposite. And we spent the bulk of it externally. So I think now it's time to, to turn our attention inward. I'm still concerned a bit about uh, the public perception that you know, nobody, from the, nobody from the city's laid off Everybody has jobs. It's working for the government, even what, if they can't come and do their function, some furloughs. But as a, for the most part, the government has fared a lot better on the basis of newly printed money from the feds than everybody else. And, and to, I think we're expected to belt tighten uh, instead of saying us first. Uh, so uh, I, I agree it's, it's warranted and there's a need. Uh, is that a greater need than keeping a mom and pop restaurant alive? But I, I'd, like to, I'd like to see as much aid as possible go to the people on the street. And logistically, John, where does that go? For example, if the Let's just say the overtime component was 60 of the 260. Uh, how do you book that? It just replenishes the general fund and goes into reserves for use at a later date, or how does that get booked? 
Yeah, Deputy Mayor Whalen, um, yeah, just like any revenue, it comes in as a revenue, like in a PL statement. So it will come in as a, um, you know, under state law, we have a certain bars account that it would be assigned to. So it would be a one time revenue source um, that would that would come in and you'd see it on you'd see it on the revenues. Got and it. then the backup, the backup would be the deal that we have on the expenditure side. Got it. Okay. Oh. Just like excess sales tax or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, I, I know from uh, Pierce County Finance Director that the way they're handling it is uh, if it's a restricted fund, it goes back to the restri restricted fund. It it's where the person's payroll came right. from that is reimbursed. Yeah. So a lot of it yeah. is general fund money, but yeah. in the county's case, it can be road crew or a utility or okay. a federal grant for human yeah. services that, that gets re reimbursed. Yeah, but most of ours, if not all of it, is general fund. Got it. it might be some in the street fund, but. No, I, I'm fine uh, supporting it. I, you know, I like uh, the mayor's comment that there's a lot of hardship out there. I think the systems are doing better at getting money to the folks that are really hurting on the street. I deal with in my day job this stuff all the time where people are closing down. Uh, businesses, uh, because the retail presence, restaurant tours, those kinds of things are just dying on the vine, several of them. Many of them are doing fine, but I'm dealing with four or five, two of which are in Lakewood. They're struggling right now. So I think the appearance of uh, backfilling our revenue is while fine. I think we just got to make sure that we do what we can, support those on the street to the best we can. So I am, I'm fine supporting, you know, the true costs that we've experienced uh, for the city because, you know, we've had to cut back. We haven't filled positions like uh, Bring Grimley's position as a result of COVID. So I appreciate that. And this will help us get us through some of the hurdles I'm sure we'll have down the road. So I'd be fine back billing or whatever the term is to utilize those funds uh, internally for staff. Uh, time expended, but I think I'd limit it to probably 200 of the 260. That's just me. You could, you could parse a feather on this one. It could be 150, 260, whatever, but I think we just got to make sure we have. So you see, it pays me 50. Yeah, I know. We just got to make sure we, we do as much as we can for the community and the child care needs and all business needs as best we can. Yeah, I think there, there's a decent chance that we're going to have problems getting all the money out. You know, for example, mm -hmm. uh, Loss. This is not losses business. They right. To do it, and they're not getting it out. It may come to the end of the day. They still have seventy-five thousand yep. dollars that they haven't given anybody. We need to right. get it back. And yep. To get it out quick. Mm hmm Actually, hard work giving away money the right way. Yeah. Hey, Don, can I ask a question? Sure. Can I ask a question, Don? What, Tiffany, what is, it seems like at the county level, Don made, made a remark that, that the money is finally moving on the, on the rental side. And then you're saying that it's maybe not flowing as quickly as we would like on our side. And I'm wondering, you know, when this thing started, I thought the rental, backfilling rental payments would eat up because rents are so high here that there would be so many people and it would just gobble up a big bulk of the CARES Act money. And I was completely wrong. What is, what is the issue with getting this thing moving and helping people with their rents? Because if they're not paying now, I mean, we're into, if they started not paying in April, you know, what, once the state says, yeah, they can start evicting people, this could be a, you know, I don't have any idea of the depth of the problem, but this could be really a mess. What, what's the issue in your mind? Uh, well, forgive me if I don't answer you directly, Councilmember Member okay. Vokey, for what you're asking. I'm not quite sure, but I'll give it a try. Okay, that's okay. Um, 
when the city received its dollars and began to allocate them, they went into business assistance, which was the $10,000 max grants out to small businesses. There were more than enough applicants for that. So as council member Farmer was saying earlier, there are a number of companies that did apply but did not receive funds once the lottery was conducted. Uh, but of those that did, those the the difficulty, some have been paid, but the difficulty has been there just simply getting the paperwork back from them once they've been told that they have gotten uh, selected through the lottery in order for us to proceed. So the, the backup paperwork required in order to then disperse funds. The money that went through this human services bucket included the large number uh, of dollars to LASA, and then there were some others as well. And from what I'm understanding with LASA in particular, because this isn't what they normally do, they've just had trouble getting up to speed to be able to disperse the funds. And so their support of um, human services, particularly, but also rental assistance, as they've been asked to do in some respects, they just haven't had a, they haven't figured out the machine yet of how to get the money out on the street. So it's a combination of trying to get individual businesses who are undoubtedly very busy and scattered to reply back with what we need, but also um, the entities that are being asked to distribute the dollars on to third parties may not be experts at doing so. Yeah, okay. I, I, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll accept that. I'll add to that as uh, that's absolutely correct. And, and the propensity of governments in general has been to go to human services providers who dealt with homelessness. And this is a very different process. This is more like a property manager process backwards. Uh, and it's alien. Some were better than figuring it out than others. And, and, it, it, and the efficiency varies. But one other thing it, it has come up both, I guess, confirmed by my longtime status as a landlord, which fortunately I barely have anymore. Uh, but I, in talking with the presiding judge, the uh, Commissioner who pre, uh, who handles the the uh, interaction with the uh, administrative office of the courts for uh, planning for unlawful detainer surges to the extent that exists or happens, and the court administrator is that tenants do not see an urgency until they actually get served with a summons and complaint, a 14-day notice to pay or vent or to pay or vacate in many people's eyes is just another more, another piece of paper that came from their landlord said, give me the money and I'll, I'll get it to you when I get it to you. Um, and so the urgency doesn't arise until they're actually facing a court date. And for that reason, there was a, a, a seemed to be a, a reluctance of people to actually apply. Hey, I got an, I got an eviction moratorium. Why do I need to worry about it? Uh, and so the success in getting people to apply was getting the word out to landlords who then put the pressure down and said, hey, you're behind your rent. I can get you two months rent if you'll fill out the paperwork and send it in. And uh, shortly after that happened, uh, it was advertised to landlords. Uh, the county was oversubscribed. Mm -hmm. But it was there was a two month lag in the process before they actually started getting it, and and that only meant that the the initial uh, application came through and was initially screened at the portal at the county. Then it went out to these various service providers, and we don't know yet exactly who's the best at getting the money out. Although I do know that Lassa said they didn't want to do it because they couldn't handle it anymore. Can I add something, Mr. Mayor? Mr. Simpson. Thank you, sir. I, uh, how to spend money can become problematic. Uh, and I, uh, I appreciate the case that the city manager has made for the $300,000. But on the other hand, I represent people in Lakewood. And that includes commercial business owners as well as small business owners moms and dads who need daycare and the money to fund those daycare centers. So I think the idea that you put forth, Mr. Mayor, about oh, 150000 it could be 175000 we we start, like you said, we hold that money back and we start, we disperse that money at the end of October. But I think the emphasis here should be on on, on the people 
and a little less on the city. Thank you. Mr. Brandstetter. Yeah, I, I uh, agree with uh, Mr. Simpson's emphasis, although I would say I would be interested in the making sure that any money the city spent on unbudgeted overtime, that that we, that we make the city whole, uh, but the regular time would be more of a, if there's money available at the end. All right, well, if we're confused enough, John. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm just gonna round up to $200,000 this first draw. Wow. So I would ask the council how, you know. You got a little bit better haircut than that, but okay. Um, and then as a part of that, and then as a part of that, we will um, actually, before we draw on that, we will communicate to you what that is, what that breakdown is comprised of. How's that? That sounds good. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then um, the last two items was um, those businesses who submitted for funding that did not make the original cut. And I'll, I'll look to Ms. Spear to see if that if that's a viable option, if you could nod yes or no, or say. That would actually be the preferred option because we already have all their initial documentation. So then council, um, you know, how do you, what do you say to that mayor? Sounds fair. Other council okay, I'm only seeing that, I'm seeing the mayor nod his head. I'm seeing council member Simpson. I'm looking for council member Farmer. What happened? Oh, there she is. Thank you. All right. I all right. It up. <laughs> I got you. Yes. <laughs> okay, um, and then the last one. Oh, and thank you, Councilmember Moss. Um, and then the last one was um, the PPE equipment um, that uh, Ms. Spear outlined up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And um, I, I didn't, I, I didn't really hear anything too lukewarm on that from the council. But might I, might I ask that as we get closer to the end of October and or November, that that's something perhaps we revisit. Yeah, I, I, if if we're not getting the money out, you can buy inventory. But yeah. okay, I, I my personal opinion on buying PPE for the masses now internally is one thing, but PPE for the masses, it's out there. Um, actually, I, I stand corrected, Mayor. It's not so much PPE; it's actually uh, physical improvements to our buildings and facilities, and kind of expanding upon the monies that we already have. And we are going to be looking at, I understand, looking at maybe requesting some funding from Pierce County on that front as well. Yeah. Okay, another, so, another thing in reserve. So, so that's what I have, Mayor. I, I, I hope I didn't miss anything, but I was trying to take as good a notes as I possibly could. Yeah, nice. So with that, Mayor, I'll turn it back over to you and your colleagues. All right. And you'll bring back a list for us. We shall. Um, at, your next, um, at your next study session as part of reports by the city manager, um, myself and Ms. Spear will work on some kind of a one or two page or just kind of uh, memorializing and summarizing what we heard your direction here this evening. And I would suggest you start, even though it's not formalized now, you start putting the administrative application process in, in motion as soon as possible so that... Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Hey, Absolutely. John. John, I just sent you a series of reports that show where the county money is going. It comes out every week. I don't know if you get it or not, but it, or, or if yeah. economic development gets it, but yeah, it shows it. Yeah. the yeah. loans that are made and where yeah. they're made. And you can see how many are getting done in Lakewood. Yep. And, and they've started the rental one, but they didn't break it out. Yeah. So... You know, the good news is that there's funding available out there for businesses, small businesses and such. So that's kind of the good news that the challenge is trying to get people to come and get it. All right. So then we'll move on to uh, by the city manager. Uh, 
Thank you, Mayor. First, I'd like to um, I'd like to call upon our Chief Information Officer Ken White to give you an update on where we are with our um, implementation of our IT strategic plan. Uh, he just wants to touch on some of uh, some key updates that we're moving forward on, particularly in the area of security and cybersecurity, things along those lines. So, um, Mr. White, I, I, if he's available, you should. I thought I saw him on a little bit ago. Kenny, you there? I am. Sorry, it oh. kicked me out and then rejoined me. Hopefully, you guys can hear me okay. Yep, I can, we, you're good to go. Thanks, Kenny. Perfect. So I uh, just want to give you guys an update on kind of the projects that are going on right now and kind of where we're going in the future. Uh, so just running through this list that's in your packet, um, as you'll see, uh, the first one on the list is the YouTube. Um, now that we're doing Zoom, we're not really using that, although there's no charge to that anyways, if we were to start using that. Uh, we continue to work on the citywide camera system. Uh, those are the security cameras that we have throughout the city hall, the parks and whatnot. Uh, there's a couple that have been added recently, one additional at the police station, a Panto Zoom, a few more to come, and also one at American Lake that the undercover officers are using over there. Uh, cloud backup storage, uh, that was through uh, some funding that the council provided us last year. Um, that's actually in play and reducing our um, backup time and also our, our infrastructure storage costs are way down for that one, so it's working well. Uh, the wide format printers have been installed. There's two HPs and there's one scanner, both in community development and um, in GIS. Uh, they're being used on a, on a decent basis. Again, there's not a lot of people in the office, so it's, it's a little slow right now. Uh, the bigger ones are the Shield X, the Recover Point, the two-factor authentication on the security enhancement side. Uh, that is something that we implemented using dollars allocated by council at the beginning of 2020. Um, those have all been put in place. All police officers now authenticate with two-factor. Uh, Shield X is protecting our virtual environment and now with staff working remotely, that's a huge thing for us. So there's been a lot of investment in security and cybersecurity and remote access. Um, EMC Recover Point is a backup solution that we put in place. Uh, we're now able to do a snapshot point in time recovery within 20 seconds. And that's between both City Hall and the police station and eventually down the road moving towards the third location for disaster recovery. Uh, the big projects that we've got going on right now, we continue with the cyber security awareness program. That's more of training and testing staff, to make sure everybody's uh, compliant with security and that they're following their email etiquette and kind of what they're clicking on, especially as we start to move towards home access. Uh, the computer replacement project, right now the big focus for us um, is really on the COVID remote work staff. Uh, we were granted some funding, you saw in the previous report, uh, that there's about $187,000 that was allocated to that. Uh, we continue to look at computer replacement, but a bulk of what we're going to be doing with remote staff is now being funded under the CARES dollars, um, although we continue to do uh, monitor replacements and local things like that without, throughout the city. Uh, the redundant data circuits, this one has been a kind of a nightmare project for us. Initially, that was running through um, CenturyLink. There was, there was some downtime with CenturyLink where they had some issues getting permits through Tacoma. Um, and then we decided to move it over to Verizon and try to speed things up. Uh, we're told that November is kind of the date for that now, especially with COVID. So things are slowing down. Uh, the business continuity plan, that one really is dependent on the disaster recovery, the, the data center being up and running, the uh, redundant data circuits. So we'll be revisiting that one towards the end of the year once we have everything in place. The new permit system, which is the PALS project, that one is up and going. Uh, the information technology side of the house has been completed. So we've integrated uh, some of our GIS with the county and all of our um, authentication through the county is now secure and functional. So we're working well there. Uh, the CARES Act funding, that one I just mentioned briefly, that's probably the biggest one that we're working on right now is really just focusing on remote access for all of our staff, ensuring that we have security protocols in place um, we're going to be rolling out two-factor authentication to all remote staff, so that'll ensure that they are who they say they are when they connect. Um, so that's a big one there. Uh, document management system, that RFP closed on the 28th of August. Uh, I'll be reviewing the first batch of those tomorrow with the city clerk, and we'll be kind of going through those and getting those off to the team uh, for further review. The police in-car video system, there's roughly about 10 vehicles left for that project. Um, so we'll be working with the police on those once the new cars are up and running, um, and that should complete uh, the batch of all of the vehicles that they have uh, for this year. And then kind of rolling down into 2021, as you see in that, mainly the focus um, this year was really 
security infrastructure upgrades, cybersecurity, uh, redundancy in, in throughput for um, all of our network-based systems. And then in 2021, continuing down the road of computer replacement, although with COVID, uh, the focus there will also be remote staff, virtual connectivity, and I can't emphasize enough security and cybersecurity, especially with people using home computers. And one thing that I'll touch on that really quick is that we are moving towards a zero client infrastructure, meaning that staff will have computers at home, but they will not have any operating system installed. They literally turn them on, they connect to the city, we'll be able to use desktops, cell phones, iPads, Android, website, Linux, Mac, you name it, anything that anybody has at home will work. Um, especially with the zero client technology. So that, that's kind of a big one for us. Um, and then there's just a couple other projects that, you, that you'll see on there, Wi-Fi access point upgrades, really that's focusing in some of our parks and uh, bringing Wi-Fi to the community. Um, and then additional server hardware upgrades in 2022. Um, but the bulk of it is pretty much done. We're just kind of on a, a move forward with COVID right now and, and within IT. So there's been a lot of work there. Uh, with that, I kind of kept it brief. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Question. Yeah, the work, work from home stuff. Uh, can do staff typically have laptops that they can plug and play both at work and at home with maybe two monitors? Because I can tell you that having two monitors is critical to my workflow at home. Are we helping staff by getting that kind of equipment? That is correct. So part of the project rolling out these um, zero uh, zero thin client solution. Um, it'll support up to four monitors where if right now they, they can only use one. So it's a single remote desktop connection that they access, which gives them a single screen. Uh, moving forward, staff will be able to go between, most of them will all have two. Uh, there's a couple that might have three, but the, the bulk of the staff will have two, two full monitors, keyboard and mouse. Um, we do have staff that have tablets and so they can come and go. But for the bulk of the staff that are working at home, those were your, your typical city hall employees, things like that. Um, they'll continue to just use a standard desktop uh, with dual monitors. Okay, very good. Anything that would help enhance productivity for sure is helpful. Definitely, and, that, and that's one of the comments that we've heard from staff is the ability to have dual monitors versus a single monitor. Yeah, critical. Any other questions? Well, thanks, Ken. Uh, a lot going on. Yeah, we are very busy in IT. We're still moving forward. <laughs> You, uh, yeah, people uh, worry about uh, having things to do during COVID, not you, right? Not us. I think police and us are, are doing good, along with the city manager. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. A um, few other updates. Uh, uh, you know, last uh, 24 hours, it's gotten a little smoky over here, and I'd like to uh, uh, recognize some city employees. First and foremost, uh, our assistant police chief, John Unfred. Uh, earlier this weekend, he was actually deployed serving in the incident management team with his emergency management hat on. He's uh, considered uh, quite the expert in that area. And so he was over in Eastern Washington. And then on his way back home on uh, yesterday evening, he was uh, redirected to the Pierce County DEM EOC to help out uh, there with all the fires that burst out over in Bonnie Lake, Graham and in Sumner. Um, and speaking of those communities under the umbrella of mutual aid, our unmanned aircraft systems team consisting of officers Lee, investigator Laughlin and officers Noble and Wellman uh, first deployed out to Graham last night to help the Graham Fire District uh, get a lay of the land, so to speak, in terms of uh, the major catastrophe that they were dealing with. Um, and then later on um, uh, this morning and into today, uh, they then redeployed over to Bonnie Lake into Sumner and helped to help them as well. Um, also, um, um, last evening in the, in the dark hours, um, uh, several of our officers deployed to uh, the city of Bonnie Lake uh, to help uh, Bonnie Lake and again under the umbrella of mutual aid to help evacuate a number of neighborhoods given the fast moving fires in that community. And I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Sergeant Jason Catlett and then officers Henson, Tenney, Moody, James and, and, and Lethbig um, just did an outstanding job again getting down there dropping what they had to do and, and get over there to help out and uh, possibly save some lives there. Um, and then lastly, here in Lakewood, uh, there was a fire over on um, 93rd uh, Street Southwest and um, the, the fire department thinks it started with uh, a power line getting knocked down because of the wind. And long story short, the, the corner of the house showed up and of course, police were there first. 
They saw smoke inside of the house and not knowing whether or not somebody was in there. Um, they kicked in the door uh, to make sure that nobody was inside the house. And uh, thankfully nobody was, but if they were, uh, those two officers would have been able to get them out. Um, fire then did show up as well as TPU to deal with both the fire and the electrical issue. And then the homeowners showed up and were able to confirm that, yeah, they were the only ones living there. So all good there. But I again, want to recognize officers Beauchamp and Pion um, for, for their role there. And, and, and again, um, going above and beyond and, and helping out. Uh, some other updates, uh, the governor and uh, the four corners, if you will, did extend the um, OPMA waiver to allow local legislative bodies such as yourself to continue to hold virtual meetings through October 1st. Uh, that seems yeah. to be a monthly issue these days. I don't know why they just don't give us six months or something like that. Um, at your next regular meeting, um, I'd like to bring forward a uh, proclamation uh, from this body to uh, the city of Gimhae, um, just again expressing the thanks for their wonderful donation. And, um, you know, as a local jurisdiction, we can't give a present, if you will, but certainly sending a nice proclamation, I think, will go a long way. We're also pulling together a video of thanks, if you will, and uh, under council comments, the city clerk would also like to take a video of all of you. Um, proclaiming your thanks to Gim Hay, and then we'd like to incorporate that again into, into this uh, video of thanks that we're pulling together. Um, you know, back in May, unfortunately, we weren't able to do our spring cleanup. However, our senior policy analyst, um, Shannon Kelly Fong, has been working with Waste Connections, and we're going to do a late summer uh, one day or on um, Saturday, um, September 26th, uh, from 8 to 2 um, over, uh, over at their transfer station. Uh, to deal with some pent up demand there. Um, however, we are planning on doing the fall cleanup in the first weekend in November as well. And that will be a two day event as it normally is on a Saturday and Sunday. Um, not sure how we're gonna um, actually work it, if we're gonna need some volunteers to check IDs, but I'll let you know. And if you wanna come out and be a volunteer, um, would certainly welcome you to uh, be able to do that and, 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 and assist. Um, a new addition to our website, you know, uh, it's kind of like fireworks or certain things that just don't go away. Uh, one of them are street ends. And um, what if I can get a smile there? A smile? Come on, somebody, anybody? There we go. All right. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, we put it out on the web page, um, including uh, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board's recommendation from a number of years ago. Um, also, um, I do plan including in the uh, upcoming biennial budget that we come back and revisit that and internally update it um, to include just further expanding the description and the opportunities and challenges with each street end in a little bit more detail, as well as maybe putting a pencil to what it would cost to develop those street ends um, that PRAB had recommended a number of years ago. Um, but again, I just wanted to give you a heads up that it is on our website. So if you have questions, uh, we can direct people there uh, on, that, on, that particular, on that particular issue. Um, on the city's finances, so I have um, some very, very good news. The caveat is this, it's only halfway through the year. Okay, it's only halfway through the year. So um, uh, sales tax is actually, um, even though it's down compared to last year, it's actually um, uh, exceeding budgetary estimates. Uh, actually, a number of our revenues are. Um, however, that's a reflection of our financial policies. Um, however, there are a number of revenues that are lagging behind quite significantly. No surprises, gambling tax, admissions tax, and park and recreation fees, as well as fuel taxes. So those are the four major revenue sources. Um, through halfway through the year, our general fund operating revenues are below budget by $540,000 or 2.6%. So it's not 2 million that I thought we were going to be. So $540,000. Um, however, um, it is down about 1.5 million compared to year day collections in 2019, which I think is a better indicator of where our economy is. And so down 6.8%. So the first number I gave you is a reflection of our good financial policies that we have in place. But at the same time, you know, our local economy is struggling a little bit. Um, on the expenditure side, the action strategies that we have put in place are working. Compared to budget, we have uh, through halfway through the year, we've saved over $2.3 million or 11.6%. Um, that's through a combination 
combination of not filling vacant positions, eliminating discretionary spending. It's also the fact that we're not allowed to put anybody in jail. We've only spent $194,000 in jail costs uh, through six months. Uh, typically, we would be at, you know, four or $500,000. Um, also events, you know, there's been no events um, been going on. So, you know, we have all of those savings. So between um, our, our, our revenues and our expenditures, we have actually strengthened our uh, one-time surplus funds in our, in our general fund, which will help us greatly as we roll into 21 and, and, and 22. Um, but again, the caveat is while this is, I consider this to be good news, it's only halfway through the year. You know, there's a lot of speculation out there in terms of, is there another shoe gonna drop in the fall? I don't, I don't know. Uh, the good news is that our economy locally seems to be doing better than most. I talked to a number of cities and uh, quite frankly, they're amazed at how we're doing. Um, so, um, so that's the good news, so that's the good news. And Ms. Krause will have a much more detailed and explicit uh, presentation for you next week as part of um, your study session. So again, more to come there, but uh, long story short, uh, good news there. Um, we got an update from WashDOT. So the I-5 JBLM corridor, so the, fit, the fourth lane that they're currently building, you know, back in 2015, when the transportation package was passed, we were told that that was going to be a general purpose lane. Because right now it's four lanes, they come to Thorn Lane, it's three lanes. Now we're going to add a fourth lane, general purpose lane. Now what we're hearing from WashDOT is that those lanes north and south are going to be an HOB lane. It's going to be an island. So I'm looking for some answers. Um, the um, regional administrator uh, of WashDOT did call me last week and told me that from an engineering standpoint, by having an island of HOV lanes, it will actually improve traffic flow. Um, so I need to have our engineers take a look at that. Um, long story short, uh, what we're being told is that um, those will not be general purpose lanes, those will be HOV lanes. Um, at the same time, the transportation chair, Jake Fye, um, state legislator from Tacoma, as part of a future upcoming transportation package, uh, you might recall me giving you an update on a conversation we had with him earlier this summer, is he will be proposing adding a fifth lane, which would be an HOV lane from 38th all the way down to North Thorn, you know, North Thorn Lane, but we've encouraged him to extend that all the way down to Mounts Road. So then there's five lanes the whole way down. Um, that does not help Thurston County, by the way, but it certainly helps us here in, in Pierce County. But I just wanted to give you a courtesy heads up that that's an update that we just got from WashDOT and um, we're still seeking um, some answers, some answers there. Um, the last update, update I have for you is um, Sound Transit. I just want to say Sound Transit went through this 10 years ago. I remember this is like deja vu. So, you know, they're, you know, they're very sales tax dependent. And so their revenues dropped off. And so in 2009 and 2010, they said they were going to delay all of these projects and nothing, you know, all these projects weren't going to get done and this and that. And that was after the, that was after the voters approved Sound Transit too. Um, and then two or three years later, the economy came back and they were back on track, no pun intended. And that's where they are today. Um, so here they are again, and they're doing their due diligence. So, you know, you got, you got to, you know, I can't fault them for that. And um, so the board is going through um, a um, um, potential schedule changes on projects. And uh, really our concern down here in Lakewood is what impact does that have on the new sounder stations that are planned for Tillicum and DuPont. You know, the fact is, is that those are, those are already planned for like 2034 or 2036. So it's not, you know, what are they gonna do? Bump it out a year? Uh, I, you know, it's, it's so far out there. Um, the bigger concern is the South Sounder extension work um, that they're planning on doing. So they're going through their analysis, both fiscal and uh, capital projects related. And um, they expect to have a better understanding of this in terms of what the impact is in the summer of 21, so about nine months from now. Um, so maybe they did learn from a, you know, about 10 years ago where they, 
kind of very quickly just kind of pull back a number of projects and then very quickly put them back on the burner. So um, I, I just wanted to again give you a courtesy heads up there that um, the sound, sound Transit Board is looking at um, you know, what the impacts are of the economic uh, decline from pan the COVID-19 pandemic is. Um, but I think the greatest risk here in Lakewood is the uh, Sounder Station expansion and adding more trains and things like that. But more to follow, more to come. So with that, Mayor, that's my report. So just a little bit of requested feedback in the uh, HOV Isle Lane Island proposal. Uh, I recall seeing a study uh, not that long ago regarding opening up HOV lanes. And actually from a traffic flow standpoint, with the existing, the then existing traffic, it would actually speed things up. The counter argument to that was that was an, a, a, an improved area that it would increase traffic because more single fam or single occupancy vehicles would be on the road and therefore it wouldn't have a long-term benefit. Plus they couldn't charge people for the lane so they'd lose revenue. So, uh, but an, I don't see where a non-revenue source limited span HOV lane would uh, could be backed up with the arguments that were used in that other case. Uh, so I would be highly skeptical of the of WashDOT's conclusion. Maybe, and here I'm a skeptic again because I have to go up to, fortunately, by virtually the Puget Sound Regional Council and Transportation Policy Board, which is coming up another week in the next week. And uh, I suspect it's more political than engineering, but that's just my conspiracy theory. And I appreciate that, Mayor. I will tell you this though, um, that the, you know, the level of cooperation and communication at the staff level between, for example, myself and Mr. Busich and WashDOT, you know, is, is good. So, um, you know, just want an explanation, that's all. They're, at the staff level, they're really good at building roads. Yep. I mean, yep. <laughs> that's what they like to do and what they do. They, they, they don't make policy. Yep. So. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Bulky. Thank you. Hey, John, uh, uh, three, three questions. Well, first of all, I'll just say, I don't know that I understand. I don't know that I can visualize the creation of a HOV lane when there is no HOV lane connected. So I'm not, I think I need to see a diagram of what they are thinking about because I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit lost on that. So to budget, how, off the top of your head, do you know how many vacancies we currently have like in the general fund and non-general fund? Well, I believe it's about 18, but um, a handful of those are backfilled with, with, some, with some contract help, like for example, in development services. Oh, okay. And that's general fund and non-general fund items? Yeah, most of our positions, um, I don't think I have any positions outside of the general fund that are oh. vacant, quite frankly. And the reason being is because they have their own separate funding source, separate from the general fund. Right, okay. Right. And then yeah. where are we on the Western state master plan? Is there any, anything new on that? So uh, Mr. Buer and his team met with uh, Western State about two weeks ago. Actually, uh, Dave you know, kind of laid it all out for him. And uh, Mr. Buer felt that the Western State Hospital staff heard him and uh, are going to go back and hopefully do what needs to be done so that they can properly move forward to the hearing examiner um, for a conditional use or for a, you know, so, so that the city can be supportive of their master facilities plan in front of the city's hearing examiner. Okay, so nothing new on how many beds they may actually have. That's one of the questions we want answered. Because that was we, the big question, right? That's because one of it the was big nebulous. Questions. Yeah, that the, okay. the two big questions are <clears throat> the number of beds, but also how do you how does DSHS plan on, on um, building these facilities over time? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other? Oh, and uh, Councilmember Boki, uh, uh, 
when I when I have a chance to go through it, I'll send you the PowerPoint presentation that Watchdot sent us as well, and you'll be able to visually see. And I'll send it to Council. Um, you'll be able to visually see what I'm talking about. All right. Is that all, Mr. Caulfield? Um, yes, sir. So. For council comments tonight, we're uh, going to say thanks to uh, Gim Hay, and I'd ask uh, Schumacher if are are you going to use individual cells of council members for this, or the entire screen at once? You know, I'm thinking it would probably come across best if each of us uh, turned our video off, unless you were the ones providing the comments. Okay. So we would turn our camera off and then individuals will provide their comments. And please be sure to introduce yourself by name at the beginning of your comments. Yeah, and your title, say you're a council member, uh, deputy mayor. Uh, and what I will do is I will just queue it up uh, by name and then you can edit that out. So you, you are editing this, correct? I hope. Correct. So, and so I will hide all um, non-video participants at, in, at this time. Okay. Let's see. Remind me what they provided, the 10,000 masks and what else? 10,000 masks and 1,000 sets of PPE. Got it. And they were not the disposable masks. They were the KF-74 kind of heavy-duty, really filter masks. So um, let's see. If I go stop video, I get my picture because that's what it's set up. What do you want me to do to disappear? Ms. Schumacher? Well, you just disappeared. So whatever you did there, which was stopped your video, you did disappear from okay, the screen. You disappeared to others. Okay. If Mr. Whalen could do the same thing, and we'll start with Ms. Moss. You want me to disappear? Yep. Okay, I will do that. Okay, Ms. Moss. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mrs. Jim Hay, my name is Mary Moss. I'm a council member for the city of Lakewood. And I just wanted to say we truly appreciate the great uh, gesture of the donation of the many face masks and PPEs that you provided. They will be going to great use. So thank you so much. Mr. Simpson. My name is John Simpson. I'm a Lakewood City Council member. The city of Jim Hayes gift of personal protective equipment and masks will save lives. John, let's start I over. Your, your sound faded out to virtually nothing. Okay. Good evening. My name is John Simpson. I'm a Lakewood City Council member. The city of Jim Hayes gift of personal protective equipment and masks will save lives. And I thank the city for its signal act of generosity and kindness. One of our American presidents, a man by, by the name of Abraham Lincoln, once said, next to creating a life, the finest thing that a person or a sister city can do is the saving one. Thank you. Mr. Bulky. I'm council member Paul Bulky. Thank you for your generous and thoughtful gift. It was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Ms. Farmer. Hi, I'm Linda Farmer. I'm a Lakewood City Council member. And I wanted to thank you, Gim Hay, for your uh, donation of PPE and masks. I have been involved with the state of Washington sourcing of PPE during COVID. And I know how difficult it has been to get quality PPE uh, for the safety of our, of our residents and our frontline workers. So your donation has meant the world to us. Thank you. Mr. Brandstetter.
Mike, if you can hear me, you blinked on and off and we can't hear you. Hi, I'm Mike Brandstetter, city council member from Lakewood. Really want to express our my gratitude to the city of Gimhe. Your gesture not only gives meaning to the idea of our being friendship cities and elevates it to the point of where we truly are friends. Thank you. Mr. Whalen. Greetings. My name is Jason Whalen. I'm the deputy mayor for the city of Lakewood. And I too express my heartfelt thanks on behalf of the residents of Lakewood for your kind and generous gift. Gimhe and Lakewood have shared friendship city status since 2006. And because of that, we've created great bonds together as communities. We thank you today for your active support, collaboration and friendship in the form of the masks and the personal protective equipment. We thank you very much, Gimhe. Gamsa Hamnida to your community. Thank you. I'm Don Anderson. It's my privilege to be the mayor of the city of Lakewood. Reaching across the ocean, Gim Hay has shown the kindness and the great love that the people of Gim Hay have for their fellow man. We are most great, we are most gracious, graciously accepting your wonderful gift, and it has already gone to great use in our community. Thank you again for all that you have done for our community. And we look forward to seeing you in person and building our even greater bonds of friendship. Thank you again. So is there any other business to come before council? Hmm. Seeing none, we're adjourned. Good night. Good night. Good night, guys. Good night.